This is a compilation of Doom lore I have created over the past few years. No intros, no outros, just lore. Enjoy. Here we explore in the lore and story behind the Doom Slayer. Way before the Doom Slayer became one of the most powerful forces in the universe, he was a simple space marine from planet Earth. While most of the early years of this hero are shrouded in mystery, it is believed that he came from a long line of war heroes, those of which included BJ Blazkowicz and Commander Keen. As one of Earth's most trained soldiers, the Marine followed his orders well, that was, until he was ordered to fire upon innocent civilians by his commanding officer. In this moment, he assaulted his commanding officer instead, this action, in his mind, was the right thing to do, but as punishment, he was dishonorably discharged from service and transferred to Mars to work with the Union Aerospace Corporation. Here, their facility was home to radioactive waste facilities on Mars and its two moons of Phobos and Deimos. For three years, the Marine worked security at this secret base and heard rumours of teleportation experiments that the UAC had been conducting. But on one day, he received a message from within the Phobos base that they required immediate military support, that something evil was coming out of the gateways. And shortly after, the Marine and the other troops travelled to the base to help them. Upon arrival, the Marine was ordered to secure the perimeter as the rest of the team went into the base. For hours, he waited for them to contact him, but all he picked up on the radio was guns firing, screams, bones cracking, and then, silence. Believing his squad to be dead, the Marine entered the facility with only a pistol in hand, and he came across the demonic entities that had used these gateways to travel from Hell to Phobos. As a skilled Marine, he managed to defend himself against the waves of these evil creatures that had taken over this facility and mutilated his squad, and over time, travelled through a portal into Hell itself. Inside, he came upon the spider mastermind who was behind this whole invasion, and using the weapons of the dead he had come across over his journey through the facility and hell, he fought with and killed this creature. After this victory, the marine discovered a hidden doorway, and upon entering it, he found himself on earth. Then he realised that while he had been fighting on Phobos, the spider mastermind had also invaded his home planet. As he travelled across the planet, he saw the chaos that this invasion had created. Whole cities were in ruins and the dead littered the streets. When he finally arrived at his family home, he discovered the bodies of his wife, child and his pet rabbit, Daisy. Everything had been taken from him and he needed his vengeance. So. He took an old family photo and a piece of Daisy with him to fuel his rage against the demons that had destroyed his life. He discovered that the leaders of Earth were attempting to evacuate the survivors of this invasion, but they needed access to a spaceport to do so. The problem was that the invaders had set up a force field around it, so the Marine, now also going by the name Doom Guy, slayed the demons in all his rage and the remaining population of humanity managed to escape the planet. As the last known human on earth and without a family, the doom guy felt like he had done his part and waited for death. But then, he received a message from earth control in space, where they told him that the invasion had actually originated in the heart of his home city. So, he travelled there and discovered another door to hell. He believed that if he re-entered, then he could close it from the other side and save the planet. Upon his arrival in hell, he destroyed every demonic entity that came across him, where the demons came to fear him. The Doom Guy was a force to be reckoned with. Eventually, he discovered the Icon of Sin, a gruesome giant demon. 
using all of the skills he had trained over this awful ordeal. The Doom Guy destroyed the beast, and, as a result, left devastation in hell and closed the portal to Earth, where he and humanity returned to rebuild their planet. As time went on, the Doom Guy struggled to adapt to a normal life. His dreams were plagued by the horrific events he had survived the demons, blood, guts, and the loss of his family. But the doctors could not help him get past this, and even worse, his battle was not over. On Mars, something had survived his wrath. Going by the name, the mother of all demons, she wandered Phobos and resurrected the dead, even more powerful than they were before. And after the UAC discovered another potential invasion was on the way, they sent the Doom Guy to take her down. On yet another harrowing journey, the Doom Guy, fueled by rage, destroyed the demons on his way to hell and slayed the mother, yet another powerful beast. But this time, he decided to close the gateway from inside hell so that he could stop any upcoming invasion from within. A sacrifice for humanity. For some time, the Doomslayer sparked fear in hell and the bodies of demons piled up around him. That was, until the Resurrector, the sister of the Mother of Demons, decided to do something about it. She wanted revenge for her sister's death, and so teleported him back to Earth into a facility overrun by demons. Following his namesake, he brought doom to every demon he encountered on his way back to hell where he came upon the Resurrector. And upon this encounter, the Doom Guy had no problem destroying her, just like her sister. And as he once again chose to remain in hell, he had a vision of a path of perpetual torment, a path through doom. And as the years passed, his mind only focused on one thing, the blood of his enemies. Suddenly, the Doom Guy found himself in a new place. This was not somewhere he recognized. Unknown to him, he had somehow traveled through space and time onto a new world. Some even say to a different timeline. The world of Argent Deneur. In this age, the Argenta people lived under the rule of King Novik, and this was a peaceful period for them. They all worshipped the Maker species, who, upon first discovery of them, gave the Argenta new technologies and information to thrive in the universe. In return for this knowledge, the Argenta went out into the universe to spread the word and teachings of the Maker to every sentient species they discovered. As scouts explored the land outside of the city of Sentinel Prime, they came upon this man that had suffered so much they brought him into their city, where they introduced him to the Argenta priests. This outlander was a species they had not encountered before, where they gathered all of the information they could about him, from his broken, bloodied body, as they could not understand the English language, his ramblings of demons, guts, and blood. By Argenta law, any stranger that came upon them was to be judged inside of the Colosseum, by trial of combat. If he died, he died. But if he won, he would be allowed to live to fight in the Maker's army. From the stands, the Argenta watched as the Outlander overcame his physical injuries and fought against the creatures of the Colosseum. They saw how he fought in a brutal, chaotic manner as his war cry echoed across the arena. Here, he even gained supporters where they chanted the words rip and tear, just as he did, even though they did not understand his foreign tongue. With his flawless technique and rage to fuel him, the Outlander survived his trial by combat, where even the best warriors in King Novik's army admired his battle prowess from afar. As the Outlander was returned to his living quarters, the Argenta documented his mad ramblings of evil, demons, death, and a world that thrived on it, hell. So, the Khan Maker, the leader of the Maker species, asked her minions to learn this foreign tongue so that she could understand what he was saying. 
as one of the first species created to understand and develop technologies, the Khan maker quickly learned English and spoke to the Outlander. As she listened, she took note of these creatures born of fire in another land that they had not yet discovered. She believed that it could be yet another place for the Agenta to spread word and gift with maker technology, when in reality, this place only wanted one thing, death. As time passed, the Outlander stopped speaking completely and focused solely on fighting for the Agenta army with the other prisoners that had survived the Colosseum. But these battles were nothing compared to what was coming. On the eve of the Black Star, the demons broke through reality and created portals of fire from hell to Argent Denur. It is unknown whether they came upon this place by chance or whether they followed the Doom Guy but a new war began. In their hordes, the demonic entities took down major settlements on Argent Denur, where many died attempting to fight them off. So, the Night Sentinels were sent in to attempt to contain this problem, where the Holy Wars began. The Army of the Angelic Makers against the Demons of Hell. It was quickly discovered that these were not normal beings and that their weapons came from the very essence of a tortured soul. It was here that it became clear that these demons had invaded Argent Denur in order to kill as many mortals as they could to acquire Hell Essence from their deaths. And as more of the Argenta people fell to these evil beings, the stronger Hell's forces became. As the Doom Guy fought alongside the other armies of Argent Denur, in the background, the best and brightest worked to understand how the demons created energy from the souls of the dead, and it was one of the priests that uncovered the secret of Hell Essence. Upon the discovery that a soul had to be tortured and harnessed with technology, they believed that if they could somehow travel into Hell, they could cut off their source of power from within and could end this war. But as they learned more about this power, it corrupted the priests and the Khan Maker, who believed that they should actually use this energy to improve their armies and the Maker and Argenta way of life. So, instead of stopping this power, they leaned into it and created their own secret factories in Hell to combine Hell Essence with the energy of the Argenta people, Wraith Essence, where they developed Argent Energy. Throughout this time, blood filled the battlefields as the demons attempted to claim more land and life from Argent Denur. Here, the Inquisitors of the Sentinel Guard took note of how long the Outlander had survived against this never-ending force as other warriors fell around him. He ripped and tore them apart and the death of one demon just spurred him on to kill more. He was a being that thrived on the death of this invading demonic force, and with this, King Novik deemed him worthy to be elevated to the King's army, the Night Sentinels. This was new for the Night Sentinels as only the Argenta people had ever been inducted into this army, but the Doom Guy showed great promise and technique. To some of the soldiers here, they believed his addition broke tradition, but others saw his ability to fight in any situation, in any condition, and still come out alive, stained in the blood of his enemies. So, he was trained as a Night Sentinel, where he learned their codes and techniques. Over time, the Night Sentinels fought many battles and took down so many demons, but more always came. So, the Doom Guy asked to enter Hell itself to fight the demonic invasion from within, where he led the charge and even impressed those hesitant to his involvement in the Night Sentinels. Over the span of three journeys into Hell, the Doom Guy fought against exhaustion, wounds, and sickness in his never ending lust for demonic blood, and he even grew stronger thanks to his brothers in the army. And as such, over the years of this awful war against Hell, the Night Sentinels accepted him as one of their own, one of their greatest warriors. Unknown to the population of Argent Denur, the Maker had perfected Argent Energy and manufactured it into weaponry to fight against the Demonic Horde. 
But the Night Sentinels felt something was off with this discovery and distanced themselves from it as whispers began of an agreement between the Maker and the Lords of Hell. Something that could not be confirmed just yet. In this never ending war, the Black Star ascended to its zenith and the war came to its climax. As King Novik sat on his throne, he was made aware of another wave of the demonic army on their way to Taris Nabad, the capital city of Argentineur, and this army was led by a monstrous titan, the Dreadnought. In its wake, the armies of Argentineur felt this giant creature and it appeared to be impossible to take it down. Although the Doom Guy joined them in this brutal fight, even he was unable to injure it as this relentless assault continued. Watching from the castle, Sama Maker, a seraphim, an elevated member of the Maker species, sought out the Outlander and brought him to the Chapel of Purity. Inside of this chapel, the Khan Maker had developed the Divinity Machine. In secret, he placed the Outlander inside and activated it. This machine had been imbued with the power of the Dark Lord himself, and as the power flowed from the machine into the Doom Guy, he absorbed it and became something new. As the Outlander left the device, he discovered that he now had the abilities of super strength, durability, speed and stamina, to name just a few, and to match his newfound ability, a person known only as the Wretch enhanced his Praetor suit so that he could thrive even better in a combat situation. Even more useful, his newfound godlike powers allowed him to absorb the souls of those he slayed, and as such, he grew more powerful with each kill. With his newfound abilities, the Doom Guy rejoined the fight with the Crucible in hand. As described by observers to this event, the Doom Guy fought against this demonic horde and reached the Dreadnought, where this true, sentinel, warrior king plunged the blade of the Crucible into its chest. And from here, he was no longer the Doom Guy or Outlander, he was the Doom Slayer. In this victory, with the Doomslayer on their side, the Night Sentinels once again took the fight to hell. With his enhanced abilities, they were able to travel deeper into this realm, also with the help of the weapons made by Argent Energy. Then, they discovered just what Argent Energy came from upon finding factories in the region of Necrovol that the Khan Maker had created with Maker technology. Even worse, they uncovered that the very energy they had been using had been created from the torture of their fallen brothers on the battlefield. Upon discovery of the betrayal of the Khan Maker and her deal with the Lords of Hell, the Doomslayer and the Night Sentinels returned to Argent Deneur. Although the Doomslayer did not care about the politics of Argent Deneur, he did care about any who allied themselves with Hell and this betrayal meant that the Khan Maker was just another creature to destroy. When the Night Sentinels told the Argenta people of what they had discovered in Hell, a civil war broke out between those loyal to and fearful of the Makers against the Night Sentinels who had fought against the demons of Hell. As the civil war raged on for years, the Argenta priests publicly allied themselves with the Night Sentinels and suggested to them that if they could enter Necrovol and shut down the factories, then the Maker and demonic forces would lose their source of energy, and thus the never ending war would cease. So, following the Argenta priests, the Night Sentinels entered the Hell Portal with the aim to travel to Necrovol. But upon entering, the Night Sentinels found themselves scattered across Hell, all separated from one another as the gates closed behind them. It was here that the Night Sentinels discovered that they had been betrayed by the priests, and this was a trap. As each of these soldiers fought alone, they fell one by one as the never ending wave of demons claimed them until only the Doomslayer and Commander Valen stood each in completely different parts of Hell. Valen survived and decided to spend his remaining days in Hell in a self-imposed exile for making a deal with the Dark Lord 
in return for the resurrection of his son. While the Doomslayer began a killing spree on every wave of demon he encountered, he had originally been able to take down these creatures with ease, but now, with his enhanced abilities, his blood fueled rage and excitement only increased. On his endless killing streak, he crushed the obsidian pillars of blood temples, took down the beasts of the nine circles, and used their suffering to fuel his rage for his goal to take down the whole of hell. It is said that the Doomslayer, trapped in hell, fought for aeons against demons, as time worked differently in this realm, and he became a part of hell's landscape. The demons knew of him, they feared him and knew that he would eventually come for them. There were always more demons to fight. As new structures were formed in hell, the inhabitants of this twisted land etched his name into the foundation. With each kill, his strength grew, undying, always thirsty for the death of more demons. At one point, the demons even selected a titan as a champion of hell and sent it to find the Doomslayer to kill him but he was too powerful and took it down. So they had to find another way to stop the murderous reign of this superpowered human. Desperate, the demon priests of the Blood Temples came together to stop the crusade of the Doomslayer, where they laid a trap inside of a Blood Temple. To do this, they lured him inside with prey into the tombs of the Blood Keep in Kadinga Sanctum. And as he entered, the priests collapsed the temple and placed him inside of a sarcophagus cursed by the demon priests themselves. In here, he was trapped, stuck in stasis. This moment created relief for the population of Hell, where they could continue their activities without the threat of the Doomslayer, and as a warning to any who would accidentally open this sarcophagus, they etched the mark of the Doomslayer on its surface. In 2095, the Union Aerospace Corporation discovered the Argent Fracture on a geological expedition to Mars. Upon observation and analysis of this, they established an outpost and extracted Argent Plasma from this fracture to solve an energy crisis that planet Earth was going through. Over time, they explored the fracture and learned of the hellish realm within, where they took armed guards with them to fight off demons as they wandered the twisted lands. On one of these expeditions of hell, the UAC came upon the Praetor suit and a sarcophagus within Kadinga Sanctum, which they extracted and brought through the fracture to their facility on Mars. In their exploration of this land, the personnel of the UAC came upon tablets and writings of a slayer that had made his mark on the land. The leader of this expedition, Samuel Hayden, was actually the Seraphim who had given the Doomslayer his powers way back when Argent de Neur fought against the demonic invasion. But following his actions during that time, he had lost his reputation and transferred his mind into a human body to hide away on Earth. Hayden appeared to want to help Earth's energy crisis and did his best to lead the UAC in their endeavours, but he suspected his protege, Olivia Pierce, of having ulterior motives. He knew of the manipulative nature of the demons of hell, and it seemed that Olivia was falling for them. So, he took the sarcophagus of the Doomslayer and hid it away from her so that he could wake him up if he was ever needed again. Later, in 2149, the Doomslayer awoke. To his confusion, he looked at the sarcophagus he had been trapped in and it appeared he was not in hell anymore. This was a human structure, but one thing had not changed. He was surrounded by demons. As the Doomslayer explored his surroundings, he put on his Praetor suit and discovered that he was on Mars in the UAC facility and that a UAC researcher, Olivia Pierce, had made a pact with a Dark Lord of Hell. In doing so, she had unleashed a demonic invasion. On his journey to understand what had actually happened here, 
he was introduced to Samuel Hayden, who kept his real identity a secret. And from here, Hayden guided the Doomslayer through the facility and updated him on the situation with the help of an artificial construct called Vega. Following Hayden's orders, the Doomslayer did what he did best, ripped and tore apart the demonic entities he came across. While it is unknown what the Doomslayer's intentions were, he complied with Hayden's orders and stopped Olivia Pierce from opening a hell portal, and after travelling across Mars and hell, he was asked by Hayden to locate the well, the source of power for this demonic invasion, to which the Doomslayer secured a helix stone, and from it, the location of the well. If he could destroy this, then the invasion would be over. Eventually, the Doomslayer made it to the well and discovered the trapped wraiths that powered it. These creatures had once been worshipped by the Argenta, but when the Maker species had come along, they were later enslaved in secret and their power used to create Argent energy. Using a crucible he had acquired on his path, he absorbed the energy from their bodies where the well shut down and he prepared to meet Olivia Pierce. In his preparation, he was greeted by the spirits of the sentinels that had died in this place, his brothers that he had fought alongside a long time ago. When the Doomslayer finally came face to face with Olivia Pierce, he watched as she was betrayed by the Dark Lords and transformed into a spider mastermind, in which the Doomslayer had no trouble in taking down. With the facility now mostly free from demonic activity and the well shut down, Hayden pulled the Doomslayer back to Mars. During this whole situation, Hayden had merely used this force of rage for his own use. He needed the Doomslayer for his combat ability to stop Olivia and to absorb the power from the trapped wraiths into the Crucible. So, when the Doomslayer arrived back on Mars, he kept him restrained as he took the Crucible from him. Samuel Hayden wanted humanity to survive, so he needed this energy to continue the production of Argent energy to fix their energy problem. He knew that the Doomslayer would be against the use of any form of hellish energy, and so, with his use of him depleted, he sent the Doomslayer away to a place where he could not interfere with his plans, but also where he would be safe from any that sought to harm him, stored in an unknown location in a state of stasis until his services were required again. From his prison, the Doomslayer was freed once again, but this time, the Martian UAC facility had not been invaded, it was planet Earth. A familiar situation to what he had encountered before. So, he got to work on finding out who was behind this invasion. He did not know how much time had passed, but at this point, it did not matter. On his journey, working with the AI system Vega, he discovered that the masterminds behind this were the Agenta priests that had tricked him and the Night Sentinels many years before. The Doomslayer always remembered and the demons, Agenta priests now going by the name of Hell Priests, and the Khan Maker were still on his list for revenge. During his adventure, he managed to acquire the control of the Fortress of Doom, a ship of Maker and Sentinel design that had the ability to teleport him almost anywhere in the universe. Following his actions on Mars, the resistance of humanity saw the Doomslayer as the saviour that would help them, while others believed him only to be a myth. Regardless, the Doomslayer managed to rescue Samuel Hayden and track down both Nilox and Ranak, where he killed them both to the anger of the Khan Maker. Finally, the Doomslayer travelled to the holy city of Sentinel Prime on Argent Deneur after many years of being away. Here, he tracked down Grav, but this death came at a cost. Although the Hell Priests had caused so much destruction to Argent Deneur's way of life, 
The death of a priest on holy ground instantly led to the Doomslayer's excommunication from the Night Sentinels. With her Hell Priests dead, the Khan Maker decided to complete the task herself, and to do this, she began a ritual to unleash the Icon of Sin onto Earth in a last ditch effort to destroy it. As this giant demonic titan had once been one of the Argenta people, the son of Commander Valen, its heart still remained that of a mortal being. With this, she could control his heart to do her bidding. After the Slayer arrived back in the Fortress of Doom, Samuel Hayden explained that he had won part of this battle, but the Khan Maker was making her next move. With a new Titan, the Doomslayer needed a Crucible to fight it, so he returned to Argent Deneur's capital city of Taras Nabad. This city, just like Sentinel Prime, was abandoned after a long war, and after fighting past the remaining demons here, he arrived at the body of the Titan he had slain. Although many believed the Dreadnought to have died during the Siege of Taras Nabad, it was actually trapped in a state of stasis, where the Blade of the Crucible kept it in this state. So, upon climbing the beast, the Doomslayer took only the hilt of the Crucible and left the blade inside of it. Following this, he wandered Taras Nabad to recharge his Crucible for the fight to come. With his weapon ready to go, the Doomslayer followed Hayden's instructions and arrived in the angelic realm of Erdak, where the Maker species came from. To his luck, he managed to interrupt the Khan Maker's ritual to awaken the Icon of Sin, where he stabbed its heart with Commander Valen's blade. This action destroyed the only loyalty it had to the Khan Maker, which left it only to crave destruction with no master to control it. And so, it turned around and travelled through a portal to Earth that the Khan Maker had already set up. Furious with the Doomslayer's consistent meddling in her affairs, the Khan Maker fled, but the Slayer caught up to her and had his revenge. With this creature dead that had created so many issues in his long life, the Doomslayer had yet another fight, the Icon of Sin. After jumping through a portal to Earth, he once again fought against the odds and took down this huge creature in an intense battle where he plunged his blade into the head of the Icon of Sin. With the Hell Priests, the Khan Maker, and the Icon of Sin dead, the invasion of planet Earth was stopped, and the Doomslayer was heralded as a hero to the human race. The war of good and evil had raged on for a long time, but following the Slayer's victory against the Icon of Sin, humanity began to rebuild, but there were still demons to slay. In an attempt to avoid another invasion attempt on Earth, following Samuel Hayden's instructions, the Doomslayer tracked down the body of the Seraphim, who he believed would be a great ally in any war to come. Unknown to him, the body of the Seraphim was actually Samuel Hayden's original form, where he went by the name of Sama Maker. After successfully retrieving this alien body from the secret UAC Atlantica facility, Hayden requested for his mind to be uploaded to the body, where the Doomslayer realised that this was the very same person that had secretly taken him away during the fight with the Dreadnought and subjected him to the Divinity Machine. Now with a great ally on his side, the Seraphim asked him to enter the Blood Swamps in Hell to retrieve the Life Sphere of the Father, who, in other cultures, went by the name of God. The Seraphim believed that if they could restore the Father's physical form, then he could be an even greater ally in their fight against Hell's forces. As usual, the Doomslayer followed the Seraphim's orders, where he completed the Trials of Malagog and gained access to the Temple of Souls. Here, he not only discovered the Father's life sphere, but also the Sphere of the Dark Lord. In his rage, he decided to destroy the life sphere of the Father and took the Dark Lord's life sphere instead. If he could restore this being into a physical form, 
then he could potentially kill the devil himself. By Hell's Law, if the Dark Lord were defeated in ritual combat, then all demonic life outside of Hell would die with him. This was the ultimate goal of the Doomslayer, and so, he proceeded to Erdak where the Maker's technology would allow him to restore the physical body of the Dark Lord. In the Luminarium, a holy place of the Makers, the Doomslayer entered with the Dark Lord's life sphere in hand. But the Seraphim ambushed him, enraged that the Doomslayer had destroyed his Maker and are now back in his original form, they fought. Unsurprisingly, the Doomslayer won and proceeded into the next chamber. After handing the Dark Lord's life sphere to the Makers in this chamber, they restored the Dark Lord in all of his glory. But strangely enough, his physical form mirrored that of the Doomslayer, the form of the greatest warrior. As soon as the Dark Lord came into full fruition, the Doomslayer shot at him, hoping to finish the fight before it even began. But this was a holy place and no blood could be spilled here. So, the Dark Lord instead told him that he would wait within Hell in the capital city of Amora, where they could fight. In this last stretch, the Doomslayer travelled across worlds to find a way to Amora, where, when he arrived, many of the other worlds accompanied him on his assault of Hell, each defending their own species that had been subjected to the relentless waves of demons but the Doomslayer had only one target in mind. In his rage, he fought past Amora's defences and finally arrived in the chamber of the Dark Lord, where they began their fight. In this battle, the Dark Lord explained that he was the original creator and his power had been stolen from him by the Father, and this had, in turn, twisted him and his people into the evil that everyone knew. But the Doomslayer did not care for his story or excuses. The Dark Lord was ultimately responsible for all of the negativity in his life. The death of his family, his rabbit and everyone he had known. And having absorbed the power of the Dark Lord from the Divinity Machine, the Doomslayer easily matched him in this fight until the Dark Lord fell down unable to keep up with the Doom Slayer's rage. In his final moments, the Dark Lord asked the Doom Slayer if he wanted to say anything to his creator, and in response, the Doom Slayer responded only with no, as he plunged his blade into the Dark Lord's chest. By Hell's Law, if the Dark Lord is defeated in ritual combat, then any demon outside of Hell's borders will fall with the Dark Lord. And following the Doomslayer's victory, they did. But as the Doomslayer also was, in part, a product of the Dark Lord, he collapsed too. This was the ultimate ending of the Doomslayer's quest to kill evil, and he had done that by taking out the Dark Lord himself, but it had come at a cost. Although the Doomslayer had collapsed, he was not dead, and in order to preserve him, some of the Maker species, now without the leadership of the Khan Maker, took it upon themselves to retrieve his body, and placed it inside of a sarcophagus just in case they needed his services again. This man had gone by many names, the Unchained Predator, the Beast, Marine, Outlander and Hellwalker, with his family and rabbit Daisy, finally avenged, he could now rest peacefully for the first time in Aeons. Here we explore in the lore and story behind the betrayed Dark Lord, Davoth. In the beginning, there was only a void. Then, out of nothing, the first primeval being formed that would become known as Davoth. As he wandered the void of nothingness, land sprouted up and bloomed around him where the first realm formed. The first godlike being was awake and this was the dawn of creation. Over time, Davoth learned to control his abilities and with the measurable powers of creation, 
he continued to work on the realm around him and named this first place in creation, Jakkad. All alone, Davoth wished for company to share this realm with, and as he thought it, the first people were born to Jakkad and the first civilization began. The people here had great ambition without restraint and lived in prosperity and wonder. Over time, they turned their home into a paradise with great wonders, cities and technology. Davoth looked at his creations from Jakkad's capital city of Amora with pride that they had thrived on this land, but this perfect age would not last. He noticed that as time passed, his people grew frail and old where their bodies of flesh failed to hold on to and sustain the undying spirits he had created for them, which ultimately led to their deaths, one by one. This confused Davoth as he did not understand why they did not have the same immortal properties that he had. He was a being of great power, but this was out of his ability to correct. With compassion for his mortals, Davoth decided to create a new species, a species that he could task with working together to discover a cure for mortality. To do this, he re-entered the void and formed a new realm in which he called Erdak. Within this realm, the first of the Maker species formed. This species were different to the people of Jakkad. They were all connected through a hive mind which allowed them to work on a single task in unison led by a leader, the Khan Maker, and guided by elevated versions of the Maker, labelled the Seraphim. Over time, all their knowledge, experiences and discoveries helped them build upon the realm Davoth had formed for them, where they too created a place with magnificent technologies and wonders, with the ultimate aim to solve Davoth's problem. After many years of watching his mortals die, Davoth felt the anguish of each passing but all he could do was wait for the Makers to find him a solution. In Erdak, the Makers eventually discovered the secrets of immortality, but over all of this time, they had observed Davoth's decline and deemed this information too dangerous to share, where they believed that if Davoth were to acquire it, then he would use it to eventually destroy everything. He was an incredibly powerful being, but they had also developed technology to counter him, and fearful that he would come for them if he discovered their secret, they chose to do something about it. After working in secret to perfect their technologies and warriors, the Makers struck and formed a seal around the realm of Jakkad, blocking it off from the many realms that have formed over this time, safe from Davoth's power. Following this betrayal, Davoth's paradise became his prison. As a result of the betrayal of the Maker, Davoth became fueled by his anger and hatred for those who had gone against him and he slowly transformed into the Dark Lord in his eternal fury. Not only did this have a physical effect on his body, but the stunning, luscious realm of Jakkad and its population fell into horror, where the land and people became twisted and jaded. The Dark Lord had been tricked by his creations who had taken everything from him, and so, he sought revenge as the paradise of Jakkad became the horrific realm of hell. Although the Dark Lord was trapped, he refused to accept his situation, and so, he pushed against the boundaries of his prison, where he was, on occasion, able to break through the seal to send through armies of demonic entities to the earthly dimensions. In doing this, Davoth and those untwisted by his fury discovered that the souls of the tortured victims of hell contained a power, which, when adapted, gave them everlasting life and increased power, hell essence. In a way, Davoth had discovered what he wanted all along, but it had come at a cost. With every defeat, Davoth grew more powerful as he absorbed the souls of his victims. From Erdak, the Makers sent armies to Hell in an attempt to stop Davoth. His rule of Hell and the death of the population of the Earthly Realms he was able to break through too. Although the Dark Lord was powerful, the Makers had developed technology that would help them in this war. The Seraphim had discovered a way to take the life sphere of a being and store it, where it could do no harm and merely exist. 
These life spheres contain the memories, intelligence and essential nature of the being. In another war, a maker fought with Davoth on top of the pyramid of the lost within hell. In this exchange, the creature was able to rip the Dark Lord's life sphere from his chest, where he also took a piece of his essence and power as Davoth's lifeless body fell to the ground. In this moment, this maker absorbed the power of the Dark Lord and became a god in his own right, blessed with the same abilities the Dark Lord had. As a new god, this maker became known as the Father. Although Davoth still was a living entity as a soul sphere, the Father refused to kill his creator and instead took his sphere to the Temple of Souls in Ingmar's Sanctum, a fragment of Erdak within Hell located at the top of a mountain protected by the Trial of Malagog. Only a fierce warrior would be able to come here, or someone with a direct connection from Erdak. Here, the father believed that Davoth could exist but not interfere with the realms outside of Hell. And so, for thousands of years, Hell would grow more twisted under the newly rising Dark Lord of each age as Davoth waited to be freed, stuck in a life sphere. Over time, the father would return to the Temple of Souls with new life spheres of flawed gods as he created new life and new realms, but the Dark Lord would still get his revenge, even if he had to wait thousands of years for it. After the fall of the Dark Lord, the father returned to Erdak as a god. From this heavenly realm, the makers explored the earthly realms and introduced themselves as godlike creatures to the species they encountered. In return for their worship and devotion, they offered these lesser beings sanctuary in the realm of Erdak upon their deaths. In this new age without the threat of Davoth, the father and the makers decided to rewrite the story of the dawn of creation and concealed any record they could find of the true story. In their scripture, they told the story of the father, the first being who created all life, and that Erdak was in fact the first realm he created upon his formation. They went on to manipulate history where they stated that the father created a second realm that he called Jakkad. Here, he created his first god, Davoth, to watch over it. Over time, Davoth grew to love his people and help them build in this realm, full of ambition without restraint given to them by the father. But as they grew, Davoth watched the people of this realm fall to their mortality, one by one. In Davoth's eyes, this was no paradise, it was torture. And here, the first seed of hell was planted. Seeing mortality as a curse, Davoth and his people sought a way to defeat death itself. His fear of being left alone in this realm plagued him, and so they stopped at nothing to become immortal just like he was, and those who did not participate in this search were punished harshly. In his almighty wisdom and power, the father foresaw what was to come, the extinction of all creation at the hands of Davoth's endless pursuit of immortality for his people. So, the father sealed off Jakkad from the other realms to save them from Davoth's destructive path, which eventually led to the battle on top of the Pyramid of the Lost, where the father ripped Davoth's life sphere from his chest. As the father had once loved Davoth as one of his creations, he refused to destroy his life sphere against the wishes of his seraphim, Sama Maker, where he stored the life sphere of the Dark Lord in the Temple of Souls. This history of the father as the creator took aspects of reality and twisted it to suit the father and his continued reign. This story of a creator who ruled a heavenly realm and a dark lord of an evil realm would pass on to countless dimensions and species across time. But with the true story hidden by the father and his followers, they would not know the truth, which fueled Davoth's eternal rage. Trapped inside of a life sphere on holy ground, Davos still retained some of his abilities. Hell was the first dimension, and so, although sealed off, it was still connected to every other dimension. Over the ages, 
The father created new species and places in the void for Erdak to watch over as Hell's armies attempted to break free. That was, until the father decided to take a step back from the physical realm and asked his most trusted Seraphim to transform him into a life sphere. In Erdak, the Seraphim had constructed the Luminarium, a holy temple home to machines that contained and manipulated the terrible energies of the very essence of life, and one of these was able to resurrect a life sphere back into a physical form. It was here that Sam and Maker placed the father's life sphere where the Maker species came to this temple to worship him, and in return, his energy sustained their lives and watched over them. Over this time, the Khan Maker continued to lead the species as they explored the earthly realms where they came across the planet of Argent Denur. Here, they guided the Argenta people who saw them as gods and a civilization grew. But Hell was getting stronger, and the father was aware of this. So, fearful of Davoth rising again, he asked Sama Maker to steal his life sphere from the Luminarium and take it to a place where no one would be able to find him in the Temple of Souls. Upon doing this, the people of Erdak were left without a god. Not only was this bad, but this also left the Maker species vulnerable. The father's influence protected them from mental and physical decay, which they called transfiguration. So, without him, they also died and then were reborn with the help of their divine machinery. The father was also essential in choosing the next Khan Maker, leader of the Maker species, who were to be reborn every 10,000 years with the collective conscious soul data of every major Maker that had ever lived and died. But without the father to choose the next Khan Maker, the reigning Khan remained in power, where she became susceptible to corruption. Within the Temple of Souls, Davoth discovered that he could speak to those who were susceptible to corruption and began to whisper to them with dark thoughts, an invisible guiding hand in which even his victims were unaware of what he was doing. As the Dark Lord whispered to the Khan Maker, he led her to believe that a Chosen One would destroy her, where a seed of doubt and paranoia was planted in her mind. Following this, she continued to listen to the manipulations of the Dark Lord, and under his instructions, she ordered those under her servitude to build the divinity machine in Taris Nabad, the capital city of Argent Dunur. She explained that this machine would act as a holy rite for the Night Sentinels, the warriors of Argent Dunur, to cleanse their impurity. But in reality, she only sought to find the chosen one she believed would end her reign as Khan. And to power this machine, the Dark Lord whispered to her the location of his essence that the father had stolen long ago as he ripped out his life sphere. While he stored the life sphere in the Tomb of Souls, he placed a piece of the Dark Lord's essence in the coffins of Erdak. Upon completion of the machine, one by one, the Khan Maker asked the Night Sentinels of Argent Denur to enter it, where it drove them mad and destroyed their souls. Unknown to her, this was the Dark Lord's plan, and she was destroying an army that had pledged their service to her, increasing her corruption. At one point, Davoth became aware of a human from planet Earth that had fought with the demons of Hell, an extremely skilled warrior fueled by his hatred of demons, and he had mysteriously found himself stranded on the planet of Argent Dunur. After meeting the priests here, he spoke of these demons and instead of helping him, they placed him inside of the city's Colosseum where they observed his impressive combat skills before placing him in one of their prisons. Shortly after, the armies of Hell managed to push through their seal into Argent Dunur, where they attacked Taris Nabad. It appeared that this was what the father had fled to avoid, and the war began as the Night Sentinels fought back against Hell's forces. Throughout this, the Khan Maker was aware that she needed power to sustain the realm of Erdak and to stop the transfiguration process that now plagued her species without the father's presence. Then, 
she heard reports of a power source within hell that could help, Hell Essence. As she and the Argenta priests experimented with this energy in secret, they discovered that if they combined the Hell Essence with Wraith energy, which the population of Argent de Neu had already been using, they could create an even more powerful form of energy, in which they dubbed Argent Energy. The issue was that the Hell Energy came from the torture of souls. Regardless, she believed she needed this energy to save her species, and so, she sent Argenta slaves to Hell in secret to build factories to refine Argent Energy. With this, she could power Erdak and the Night Sentinels could fight back against Hell's forces on an even battleground, but at the cost of tortured souls. On the eve of the Black Star, Sama Maker, at this point acting as an advisor to the Khan Maker, suddenly found his faith in her clouded. Unknown to him, this was yet another one of the Dark Lord's whispers. In this, he was told that the Khan Maker would lead them to ruin, and subsequently, was guided to release the human prisoner and place him inside of the Divinity Machine, but this time, he reversed the polarity of it, giving him power instead of destroying him. As the machine activated, the human, Doom Guy, absorbed the essence of the Dark Lord that powered it, and gained incredible abilities. In a way, he became another primeval, a godlike being powered by the Dark Lord and fueled by a rage for demons, where he became known as the Doomslayer. The Dark Lord's plan was working. He now had a warrior powerful enough to fight with the Khan Maker and other powerful beings. He just needed to wait for the Doomslayer to turn against them. The Doomslayer hated all evil, and those that the Dark Lord had corrupted would soon meet their end. As the war between Hell and Argent de continued, the Night Sentinels discovered the slave factories that the Khan Maker had set up. At this point, the Doomslayer had joined the Night Sentinels and fought alongside them. At a pivotal point, the Argenta priests explained that there was a place in Hell that the Night Sentinels could use to end this war, and after arriving here, the army found that they had been betrayed by the priests as Hell's army swarmed them. One by one, the soldiers fell until only the Doomslayer fought, a being so powerful that they were unable to defeat. So, they lured him into the Kadinga Sanctum and trapped him inside of a sarcophagus, where he would wait to be freed. The Dark Lord had created a domino effect in which he hoped would lead to the Doomslayer taking out those who had betrayed him. Over time, the Doomslayer was released from his prison and he fought with many demons, fueling his rage. Following his release, he destroyed the Well, an Argent energy power source developed by the Khan Maker and the Argenta Priests, who now went by Hell Priests, which stopped the flow of power Erdak and the Maker species needed to thrive. In response to this, the Khan Maker led an assault on planet Earth with the aim to use the souls of the humans to replace the energy source the Doomslayer had destroyed. This eventually led to the Doomslayer entering Erdak, where he fought with the Calm Maker. As a being powered by the essence of the Dark Lord, he was able to stop her reign of terror. In her haste to take Earth, she released the Icon of Sin before her confrontation, which removed the seal that protected Erdak from Hell. Due to this, Davoth had another win. His demons could now enter the Holy Realm, with the Khan Maker dead at the hands of the Doomslayer, and Erdak now overridden by demons, he continued to whisper his dark truths to the corrupted. On his path of hatred, the Doomslayer managed to complete the trial of Malagog and discovered the life sphere of Davoth. He understood that by Hell's law, if the Dark Lord was defeated in ritual combat, any demon outside his realm would be destroyed and with the ultimate aim to destroy evil and save the realms outside of Hell, he destroyed the life sphere of the Father and took Davos' sphere to a now corrupted Erdak so that he could restore his body in the Luminarium. Although the Father's life sphere had been destroyed, 
Sama Maker had previously transformed a part of him into an AI system called Vega to watch over Earth, hidden away from the view of the Dark Lord, just without his essence of power. After the ritual, the Dark Lord found himself in a physical form, mirroring his greatest warrior. Hell needed a strong leader to guide them, and what better form to do this than the Doomslayer? Here, the Doomslayer attempted to shoot him, but this holy place did not allow blood to be spilled, and so, Davoth ordered the Doomslayer to meet him within Hell in the capital city of Amora where they could have their fight. The Doomslayer had fulfilled the goals Davoth had set for him, but in order to have his true vengeance, the Doomslayer also had to die. As he returned to his realm in physical form, Davoth prepared for battle. He did not have the abilities he used to have, but the first people of Amora had managed to remain untwisted by Hell thanks to the power of Hell Essence. In this time, they had grown the city and technologies even more where they used their knowledge to build a mech suit for the Dark Lord. As the Doomslayer arrived and fought with Davoth, the forces of Hell battled around them with the armies of the other realms as the final confrontation between good and evil commenced, where Davoth told the truth of the dawn of creation. After a brutal fight between these two godlike beings, Davoth fell to the Slayer and he accepted his fate. The Doomslayer had beaten him fairly in combat, and so he had the right to finish him. The Dark Lord was evil, but he was honourable. In his final moment, he asked the Doomslayer if there was anything he wanted to say to his creator, and in response, the Doomslayer said no as he struck his chest, killing him. As decreed by Hell's Law, the Dark Lord had been defeated in ritual combat, and so, all demons outside of Hell's borders were destroyed with him. Although Davoth had failed and died at the hands of the Doomslayer, a being of his own creation, he had still won in part. The Doomslayer's need for vengeance and anger at the demons had led to the fall of Erdak, the death of the Carnmaker, and the destruction of the Father's Lysphere. As the Doomslayer had gained his abilities through the essence of the Dark Lord in the Divinity Machine, and bore his mark as a result, he too fell with the Dark Lord, not to death, but he felt weaker. With Davoth's enemies dead, he had not failed completely. This was not the end of everything, but he had managed to manipulate many beings as a mere life sphere from the Tomb of Souls. Davoth had been betrayed by his own creations, and he felt his revenge was justified until the very end. Here, we explore in the lore and story behind a being of many names, God, Vega, and among the angels of Erdak and population of Argent Denur, the Father. In the beginning, there was only an endless void, and one entity alone wandered it. This was the first god, deity, primeval being known in existence. Davoth had incredible power, and where he lingered, entire realities bloomed. When he stopped to rest, the realm of Jakkad, the first realm, appeared and grew around him. In this dimension, Davoth created the first denizens with burning ambition without restraint. They were created for greatness, and just as he had hoped, over time, the stunning, bountiful realm of Jakkad allowed this population to form into a grand civilization. In this paradise, the people aspired for greatness. They, however, soon encountered a problem. While they had created the perfect land and way to live, they discovered that their mortal bodies could not sustain their undying souls. As they aged, they died one by one. Mortality was viewed as a curse by Davoth. His people were pure, and despite his unimaginable power, even he could not save them from death. Davoth hated this, to save his creation and to stop himself from eventually ending up alone. He ordered the population to seek out a cure for this curse at any cost. 
Alongside this, he created another realm with a new species designed to aid in this task. Within the heavenly realm of Erdark, the Maker species work together with their hive minds in unison like a machine to understand the laws, physics, and very nature of how their dimension and the other created dimensions functioned. With this knowledge, they leapt up the technological ladder and invented incredible machinery and techniques to help them in their task. As time passed, Davoth became cruel and angry without this cure and punished those who did not participate in this search. In Erdak, the Maker became extremely powerful, aided by new technology and weaponry. They also cared for the mortal creatures of the realms and watched over Davoth as he fell even further from the god he had once been. They eventually did discover the secrets of immortality, but at this point, deemed the information too dangerous to share with their now mad god. His anger and rage was a threat to all existence and they had to act to stop him to save everything. Using everything they had learned and developed, the Maker struck Jakkad and formed a seal around it. This seal trapped all inside, even Davoth, and kept the mortal world safe from his vengeance. This betrayal infuriated Davoth, and from him, the Pleasure Lake spoiled into the blood swamps, the lakes, rivers, and oceans turned to fire, and the denizens of this land twisted and mutated into demonic entities. As for Davoth, he transformed into the Dark Lord and swore vengeance on everyone and everything. The Maker watched as Jakkad turned to darkness and became the demonic realm of hell, but the rest of the earthly dimensions were safe, or so they thought. Davoth banged against the seal around his realm with all of his fury until cracks formed. With these, he was able to send through armies of demonic legions into the earthly realms to destroy everything they could. From Erdak, the Maker once again decided that, that they had to act, and this time, entered Jakkad to stop him completely. Towards the end of this devastating war between angels and demons, Davoth found himself on the top of the Pyramid of the Lost against the most resilient of the Maker species. In this moment, one of them used their advanced technology to rip out the Dark Lord's life sphere, and as a result, Davoth's lifeless body fell to the bottom of the pyramid as the Maker claimed victory. This sphere contained the memories, intelligence, will, and the essential nature of Davoth's consciousness, and now it was held in the hands of the hero of this war. This action not only won the war, but it also had another effect. From the sphere, the Maker absorbed Davos' power and became something new. A god with abilities just as powerful as Davoth, and in this moment, this Maker ascended into the divine being now known as the Father. Davoth still lived in this form in the sphere, and the Father had to make a choice. Destroy the Dark Lord or allow him to live in this prison? He could have easily destroyed his creator, a threat to life itself, but the father could not bring himself to do so. Instead, he placed the Dark Lord's life sphere within the Temple of Souls within Ingmore's Sanctum, a piece of Erdak that seemed to have fallen to hell. To stop the demons of hell from acquiring this sphere, he recreated the seal around the realm. This time, it not only stopped all demons from setting foot in Erdak, but it also stopped all of Erdak's creations from entering hell too. The father had stolen the power of his creator and ascended for the safety of every dimension and creation in existence, and as a new god, the entire maker species worshipped him. Alone in the Temple of Souls, the Dark Lord waited and plotted his revenge for aeons to come. Within Erdak, the Father helped the Maker recover from the devastating war. With his power, he explored everything Davoth had created and continued with the work of his predecessor. 
Here he formed an untold number of new worlds and dimensions, and each one of these became home to countless new species and civilizations. He was good and became the god and leader the Maker species had originally wanted. He was also aware that the Maker were not immortal and towards the end of their naturally long lives, they went through a process referred to as the Transfiguration, a painful experience in which they experienced both biological and mental degradation. However, their technology and the very essence of the father allowed them to bypass this, with the choice to voluntarily die and resurrect. As the father continued his work and created new life, the maker watched over these new, early species and deemed it their duty to help them as angels of the creator of all. After they introduced themselves, they offered their undying souls a place in Erdak after their mortal bodies had moved on in return for their worship. When the Maker explained the story of creation, they made a few changes. In their version, the Father was the first god in existence. In this tale, he created Erdak first along with this angelic maker species, and then he created Jakard with a primeval being to watch over it and the population within. As the father's first god, Davoth cared deeply for the great minds of this paradise as they created a grand civilization culture and achieved great marvels. Davoth was once again proud of his denizens, but he was plagued by their deaths as age took them. They were mortal, and although he was a god, he could not save them from the curse of death. The father watched from his realm as Davoth grew mad in his quest for everlasting life and feared for the lives of the population of Jakard as well as for the rest of life in his other realms. He foresaw that Davoth would someday rise to challenge him in his madness, and so he sealed Jakard away from all of the other realms and dimensions. In his rage and betrayal from his creator, Davoth bent all of Jakard to his will and his rage consumed the entire land and population around him. This was the creation of hell, demons and the rise of the Dark Lord. The father deemed Jakard and the creation of a population without pain, restraint and generally misfortune a mistake, and as a result, his newest creations were given these mortal pains and misfortunes in order to make them appreciate life, empathy and peace. Davoth of course fought against the seal and broke through into the father's newly created realms. In response to this, he re-entered hell for the final time and ripped Davoth's lysphere from his chest in order to keep life itself safe. This adapted story painted the father in a more favourable light to those who worshipped him, and over many years, with the help of the maker, they did. The truth was wiped from history, and only few would ever discover the true story. For untold aeons, the father served as a guiding light for the maker species as he continued to create new dimensions for new life to thrive. Not only did he plant the seed for new, early civilizations, but he also created new primeval beings to watch over the realms. Although he had put a lot of work into his creations, he soon grew frustrated when some of these creations acted in ways that he did not approve of. Hell was the first realm ever created, and as a result of this, it was connected to every realm. From here, Davoth, although in the form of a life sphere, still had some power and sought out those susceptible to corruption. For those weak enough, he whispered dark truths and manipulations in order to push them to act against the father and his creations. These actions were not lost on the father. He could not stop Davoth from these tactics, but he could rectify these divine errors that fell to Davoth's lure. So, he transformed the corrupted gods into life spheres and placed them in the Temple of Souls, and over time, these errors became more frequent. 
On top of this, without a Dark Lord to guide Hell, the Twisted Dimension fell further into discordance. Due to this, the father decided he would withdraw from the physical realm to prevent the chance that Hell or even Davoth would absorb his power. These entities grew stronger with each day as they formed new leaders, more beings were corrupted and the boundaries of Hell were challenged constantly. To complete this task, the father asked his most loyal servant, Sama Maker, to transform him into a life sphere, and after this, he placed the father inside of the Luminarium, a holy temple within Erdark, a place designed to house and resurrect life spheres. For many, many ages, the Maker came to the Luminarium to worship the father's sphere as Sama Maker watched over him and without the father to truly guide the maker species, more responsibility fell onto the Khan maker, a being birthed by the collective maker consciousness. The maker of course continued on their goal to educate every species about the father to garner their worship, and on their travels through the earthly realms, they came across the planet of Argent de Nur. This species, the Argenta, already worshipped another god, the elemental wraith species, they however also felt abandoned by them. Their calls for help for protection against natural disasters, disease and bandit attacks were left unheard. In return for the worship from the Argenta, the Maker offered them knowledge of new technologies, a place for their souls in the heavenly realm of Erdak upon their deaths, and various other benefits that would help them survive. In their worship of the Father and knowledge of the tale of how he defeated the evil Dark Lord, they were likely less susceptible to the corruption and manipulations of Davoth. The Argenta accepted this offer and they soon boomed. Their technology allowed them to not only advance and construct incredible cities, but it also allowed them to leave their planet and explore other worlds under the banner of the Maker. Across the universe, they spread the tale they had been told to bring the civilizations they encountered also under the worship of the Father. Over time, from his fear, the father continued to monitor the worlds he had created and feared the rising dangers in hell. The entities within had grown much stronger and were close to breaking through the seal into the earthly realms. To protect himself and his power from being taken, he called upon Sama Maker to take his fear to a place that no one would find it. As a loyal servant, the Seraphim stole the father's fear and travelled to Ingmo's sanctum and placed him with the other life spheres. Only few could access this place, and if only Sama knew of his new location, it would be only Sama the father would have to worry of falling to corruption. In this case, the father was safe. Sama was completely devoted to his god without question. Eventually, the hordes of demonic entities broke through their prison seal and finally had access to the earthly dimensions. Upon traversal through one of these tears, they found themselves on Argent de Nur. This was the start of the Unholy Wars. The Khanmaker at first helped the Argentan's strongest army, the Night Sentinel, in their fight against the never-ending waves of demons. However, she soon heard the whispers of the Dark Lord. The father had disappeared long before, and without his essence, she had remained Khan Maker instead of the regular 10,000 year limit in which another Khan Maker was destined to be born. She also feared for her species. Without the essence of their god, they could not stop the awful transfiguration process that would soon plague them. The Dark Lord convinced her that someone would lead to her downfall, and to seek them out, she had to build a machine. As many died, the Khan Maker created this divinity machine and imbued it with a shard of the Dark Lord to power it. When soldiers suspected of being her downfall were placed inside, the machine destroyed them. 
As the Black Star ascended to its zenith, a new wave of demons and a monstrous titan, the Dreadnought, attacked the holy city of Taurus Nabad. Here, Sama heard the whispers of the Dark Lord. It told him to find the human outlander that had mysteriously arrived on Argent Dunur just before this war had begun, place him into the divinity machine and reverse the polarity. Upon doing so, the Outlander, or Doomguy, absorbed the essence of the Dark Lord from his shard inside of the machine, and he became the Doomslayer. Sama only wanted to help those around him, and the Doomslayer went on to slay the Dreadnought. This war was only beginning, but Sama returned to the Temple of Souls. Here, the father foresaw that one of his favourite worlds, planet Earth in the Milky Way galaxy, would soon discover hell. To help guide humanity through this discovery, he once again tasked Sama to help him. Argent Dunur had slowly become an unwinnable war, and the corruption from the Dark Lord had slowly taken over the Khan Maker and the high ranking positions of the planet. The father decided to willingly give up his throne in Erdak to save humanity, and to obscure himself from the vision of the Dark Lord, Sam adjusted his life sphere. In essence, he split him. He left all of his power and ability inside of the sphere, and deconstructed his personality and consciousness into an artificial intelligence. Then, they left for Earth. Upon his arrival on planet Earth, Sama Maker used Maker technology to implant his consciousness into a cloned body in order to fit in with humanity. Here, he went by the name of Samuel Hayden and created a backstory for himself. He was a member of the wealthy Hayden family and studied theoretical physics at Oxford University. With his wealth, he made a name for himself as a sponsor of Bright Minds through the Samuel Hayden Foundation. His name soon became well known as a prodigy. From all of this, and as the general director of the Global Science Council, he was later offered a position with the Union Aerospace Corporation. This is where he needed to be to guide humanity. The UAC was a global mega corporation and had the resources to explore Earth and space. Planet Earth was on the verge of an energy crisis and the population needed to find a way to power the planet. To help in this search, in 2095, the UAC conducted a geological survey mission to Mars. During their mission to terraform the planet to become habitable, they also searched for a power source, and in the Promethei Terra region, they discovered the Argent Fracture. The Fracture allowed the personnel of the UAC access into a new realm. Unfortunately for them, this realm was Hell. Sam and the Union Aerospace Corporation understood that this fracture could solve all of Earth's power problems if they used the Argent Plasma accessible from it. So, the UAC appointed Samuel Hayden as the head of a newly constructed facility on Mars to extract the Argent Plasma, explore the dimension, and research other scientific endeavours. A facility of this size with over 60,000 employees required something just as powerful to run it. This was where Hayden brought in the father in his new form to observe humanity and their discovery of hell up close. Samuel Hayden introduced the father as an extremely advanced artificial intelligence system called Vega. Due to the process in which his mind had been extracted and turned into this form, Vega was unaware of what he once was. This only helped in the father's original plan to evade the Dark Lord and his corrupted minions. Vega was introduced as the first truly autonomous artificial intelligence system that could run the Mars UAC facility that did not need the operation of a human. His friendly personality was implemented to make his interactions with humanity seamless, and his voice was placed around the 50 years old mark. 
As with most cases in the development and understanding of an AI system, Vega was subjected to the Turing test. The Turing test was developed by Alan Turing to test a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behaviour equivalent to or indistinguishable from a human. In the case of Vega, a blind study was conducted with computer science students. They were instructed to ask a series of questions to Vega and a mathematics professor from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. From the responses they received from both, the students were then asked to state which of the two parties they believed was the computer. After the results were compiled, Samuel Hayden was told that 92% of the students thought they were both human, while the other 8% believed Vega was the computer. Interestingly enough, Vega played the part of both Vega and the MIT professor. A god's mind adjusted into an AI was incredibly powerful, and this became an obstacle Samuel had to overcome. The power required to operate Vega was estimated to generate a temperature of 1.2 megakelvins, much hotter than the surface of the sun. To contain this heat, a massive, supercooled structure, Vega Central Processing was constructed miles away from the main UAC Mars facility on one of Mars's polar caps. This allowed the miles of circuitry and the millions of processing centers space and the correct temperature to function. Powered by Argent Plasma from the Argent Fracture, Vega helped the UAC design better analysis theorems, Argent Compression Schema for the development of Argent Catches, and the Argent Tower. Without Vega, the UAC would have struggled to convert the raw Argent Plasma into Argent Energy. Over the following years, Vega was essential in the daily operations of the UAC facility. He continued on through Samuel's diagnosis of brain cancer as a result of his proximity to the Argent Tower, well into Samuel's transformation into a new robotic form. The development of the Argent Tower allowed this facility to convert the Argent Plasma into energy, and with it, saved Earth from their power crisis. While Sam had lost his human form due to the tower, a positive side effect did come from this. Samuel's frontal and temporal lobes were adapted in this transfer, and with it, allowed him to bypass the seal that the father had created. In this new form, he could once again enter hell. Over time, Sam led many expeditions into hell to explore what the twisted dimension had absorbed of Argent Deneur after he and the father had abandoned it. On one of these, he discovered a sarcophagus with the Doomslayer inside. It appeared that Argent Deneur had in fact lost in this unholy war. The father had foreseen Earth would soon suffer a similar fate if they did not intervene, and with the Doomslayer, a powerful being infused by the power of the Dark Lord now in their possession, they could stand a chance. Soon after, the Dark Lords of Hell managed to corrupt and manipulate one of the UAC scientists, Dr. Olivia Pierce, and under their instructions, she allowed the Demons of Hell access to the UAC Mars facility. This time, Samuel Hayden was ready with a great weapon, and Vega could help guide them. As the demonic invasion flooded the UAC facility, the Doomslayer woke up and with the guidance of Samuel Hayden and Vega, he learned what had happened and discovered the high casualties and damages here. The Slayer eventually met Hayden in person, and the robot attached a tether system to the warrior's praetor suit so that he could pull him back from hell if he needed to. On his fight through the UAC facility, the Slayer learned from Sam and Vega that he needed to acquire the Crucible, an ancient weapon powered by Argent Energy, to shut down the well, an immense energy source that kept open the connection between Mars and Hell. 
An issue arose when the Slayer eventually recovered the Crucible and needed to find another way back to Hell in order to use it on the well. Within Vega's central processing, the Slayer was instructed by Sam to follow Vega's instructions to open a portal back to Hell. The machine explained that he believed he was created on Mars in this very facility and that it took approximately 2.4 terawatts of power to sustain his operational facility. Abilities. This energy source, however, could be used to power a portal. Vega was aware that this action to use his power would kill him, and as he was unable to self-terminate, he had to instruct the Slayer on what to do to ultimately kill himself. The Marine fought his way through the demonic infestation here and destroyed Vega's neural processors in preparation to initiate the Core to Destruct. To Vega's luck, just before the Slayer hit the button, he noticed an option to create a backup of the AI, and with this opportunity, he did. The destruction of Vega's core ripped open a portal and pulled the Slayer through, in which he fought his way through to the well and shut it down. Having completed this mission, Hayden used a tether to pull the Slayer back into the facility, and imprisoned in this device, Sam took the Crucible to use it to continue to power Earth without the Argent Fracture, and he sent the Doomslayer somewhere safe that he could not interfere with his plans. As for Vega, he waited to be reactivated. Despite all of Sam and Vega's attempts to stop the demonic invasion from reaching Earth, by 2150, Sam realized they had failed. Through the weaponization of the Doomslayer, they had cut off Hell's connection to Mars. However, the destruction of the well resulted in unforeseen consequences. The Khan Maker had fallen so far since her corruption and she needed an energy source to stop the transfiguration process that plagued her species. The well had once been that source after the disappearance of the father, but without it, she sought an alternative, the souls of humanity on Earth. Sam of course returned to Earth with the Argent powered Crucible in order to lead the charge against this invasion, and as he did this, the Doomslayer woke up with Vega. Over a short period of time, the Slayer managed to acquire a spaceship of both Maker and Argenta design. The Fortress of Doom was an incredibly powerful ship and allowed the Slayer to fold space itself to reach almost impossible locations across dimensions. He could not pilot this himself, so he uploaded the backup of Vega he had created to the ship's internal system. From here, Vega communicated with the Slayer as they hunted down the culprit responsible for the invasion. As humanity continued to fall, the Slayer, with the help of Vega and later Sam Hayden, managed to discover and kill the three Hell Priests that had been tasked to carry out this attack by the Khan Maker. The death of her Hell Priests, and thus the end of her invasion, forced the Khan Maker to act. She warned the Doomslayer that she planned to awaken the Icon of Sin, a demon of immense power to destroy Earth and with it, harvest all of the souls of the remainder of humanity. In order to stop this, Hayden advised the Slayer to travel through the Hell City of Necrovolt to use a portal there to reach Erdak. To leave there, he would require Vega to create a portal back to Earth once he had stopped the ritual to awaken the Icon of Sin. To do this, Vega detached himself from the Fortress of Doom into an external drive so that he could travel through with the Slayer. This would change everything for Vega. The heavenly realm of Erdak, home of the Maker, was untouched, uncorrupted, and a safe sanctuary away from the hordes of demons that the Doomslayer had fought through on his way here. Upon his arrival in the Ritual Chamber, the Slayer stabbed the heart of the Icon of Sin, and, as a result, removed not only the Khan Maker's control of it, but shattered the Father's seal in the process. Without a controller, 
the icon traveled through a portal behind him and arrived on Earth. The Slayer's mission had not gone to plan, and now he had to get back to Earth to fight with the Icon of Sin. Without the Father's seal, Erdak slowly became infested with demonic entities. The Slayer fought through these and arrived at a command center for the celestial rings that generated portals to the other dimensions. In here, the Slayer inserted Vega into Erdak's systems. Upon his direct connection to Erdak, Vega saw everything. He instantly knew who and what he was. He was the father. Vega stayed within Erdak as the Slayer went on to defeat the Khan Maker and the Icon of Sin. Having completed these major tasks, it appeared Earth was finally safe and the Father's plan had worked. Within Erdak, the Father continued to learn about everything he had missed in his absence as the Doomslayer returned Sama Maker to his original Seraphim form. The demons had access to Erdak and with it, access to Maker technology to every world and dimension. The father had indefinite access and understanding of his world systems, but he lacked the control to remove the demons and reseal the void. So, Sama asked the Slayer to help him return the father to his physical form so that he could reseal hell from every other dimension. In Sama's words, be grateful. Despite your transgressions, you are given the honor to serve the gods yet again. This did not go down too well with the Slayer, and having been caught in this war between gods for many years, he instead planned to destroy the Father's Sphere. If he resurrected the Dark Lord's Sphere instead, he could fight him in ritual combat, and if he won, all demons outside of Hell's borders would fall with him. The Doomslayer successfully fought his way through the Blood Swamps and reached the Temple of Souls. Sama begged him to act quickly as the effects of transfiguration had begun on his body, but despite Sam's desperate pleas, the Slayer shattered the Father's life sphere in front of him. As the Slayer entered Erdak, the Father spoke to him. He explained that without a physical form, he was merely a presence, and he needed his fear to return to full power, completely unaware that the Slayer had shattered it. The father would never be the same again. If order was not restored to Erdak, then the demons posed a threat to all of his creations. The Slayer eventually arrived at the Luminarium with the Sphere of the Dark Lord, and Sama stood guard of the Ritual Room entrance. The Slayer was determined to bring back the Dark Lord, and after a brief battle, Sama soon fell to the Slayer. Although Sama had lost, the Father once again spoke. He told the Slayer that Sama had acted only on his command over all of these years, and interestingly enough, he teleported his loyal servant out of harm's way. Although he claimed that he was merely a presence, he had some power within Erdak's systems. The Slayer went on to bring back the Dark Lord into a physical form, although he himself had no chance to return to his physical form. The Father still guided and granted the Slayer access to the ship of the Elemental Wraith and through to the Gate of Devum to Amora, the capital city of Hell in which the Dark Lord resided. Although the Doomslayer had destroyed his chance of becoming whole again, if the Dark Lord were defeated in ritual combat, then all demons outside of Hell's borders would die. This meant that his creations would be safe. Within the Dark Lord's Sanctum, the Slayer and Davoth fought. In this final battle, Davoth explained to the Slayer that he had been betrayed by his own creations and he wanted revenge. Without their interference, Imora and the people within would have been perfect. His creations instead stole his power. Davoth demanded that the Father tell the Slayer what had happened, and he did. The Father confirmed that Davoth was his creator, and that when Davoth fell, he ascended. 
As the battle raged on, the Doomslayer managed to defeat the Dark Lord in ritual combat, and as a result, as prophesied, every demon outside of Hell's borders fell with him. This unfortunately also included the Doomslayer. He had been turned into a godlike being through the divinity machine powered by a shard of the Dark Lord. In this weakened state, the Doomslayer was placed inside of a sarcophagus by the remaining loyal followers of the Father, and he would remain here in the Temple of Souls in the event he was ever needed again. Over the span of many, many years, a simple member of the Maker species participated in a war against his creator and became a god. The father went through a lot, and subsequently, also put his subjects through the same turmoil. From a Maker to a Life Sphere to an AI, the father, or Vega, already has had a long, tumultuous life, and with the Doomslayer's help, it just continues. With the Khan Maker dead, and the demons of hell once again trapped in their twisted dimension, the future of the father is unknown. He once had almost unlimited power, the power to create entire dimensions and worlds. During this period, he may have hidden away some of his power in the event he lost it. As of now, he remains as the leader of Erdak as his loyal followers continue his command. One of these being Samur. If the story of this disastrous timeline does continue in some form, surely the father will be there. Here we explore the lore and story behind the destructive icon of sin. Way out on the moons of Mars of Phobos and Deimos, a research corporation, the UAC, began experimentation and work on interdimensional space travel. During the development of these new technologies, the secret team created gateways. In the early days of this exciting breakthrough, they used these gateways to throw objects from one moon to the other. This was groundbreaking, and shortly after, they deemed it safe enough to move through themselves. What they found in between these gateways changed their lives forever. The team soon discovered a realm within, a twisted, chaotic land full of evil creatures that only wanted to kill what they saw. They had discovered Hell, a new dimension, and the worst part was that Hell had not only discovered them, but the evil within now had gateways through into the earthly dimensions. With this technology, the cruel, demonic entities flooded through into the UAC facility and all the team inside could do was call for help. Over the following hours, a marine arrived at the site on Phobos and used his military training to fight through the hordes of demons right through to hell to stop this invasion. Here, he took out the spider mastermind seemingly responsible, and it appeared that this demonic invasion had failed. However, a new invasion had already begun on Earth, and there was an even more terrifying creature behind it. In the depths of hell, the Icon of Sin used its abilities to manipulate space and time to open portals from hell to planet Earth. The creature wanted only death and domination, and as long as it lived, the lesser demons around it had access to the vulnerable human population. The Icon of Sin, in its chamber, was only shown by its head as the rest of its body was hidden away. As a higher demon with immense abilities, it resembled images and drawings of what humans had perceived demonic entities to be. A giant creature with the head of a goat, in this case a biomechanical head, towering over those below it. Interestingly enough, the creature's brain appeared to be exposed, making it a weak spot in the event someone or something ever fought against it. 
As the marine returned to Earth, he saw as cities fell and the population dwindled. The death of the spider mastermind had not stopped this invasion, and after the marine did everything he could to save what was left of humanity, he returned to hell in search of the demon responsible. After the slaughter of many demon kind, the marine arrived in the chamber of the titan Baphomet, the icon of sin. Despite the defences of many demons, the titan teleported into the chamber to help it fight the marine. The human took advantage of the creature's exposed brain and fired a rocket into it. Upon impact, the titan thrashed its limbs as it crumbled and sent waves of destruction across hell's surface. The death of the Icon of Sin destroyed the portals the demons had used to reach Earth, and without this access, the invasion stopped. On Earth, the population attempted to rebuild. Some time later, the UAC continued with their experimentation with these gateways, despite the chaos this had caused in the past. This time, they formed a base on one of the moons of Jupiter, much further away from Earth in the event a similar disaster occurred. Once again, the forces of evil discovered the gateways and made their way through. Over the following hours, a marine stationed here fought against the waves of demonic entities, and he first destroyed the Icon of Sin that went by the name of the Demon Spitter, and later encountered another called the Gatekeeper. Both Icons of Sin acted and appeared the same as the original. Upon their deaths, the hellish invasion stopped, and humanity Humanity no longer had to worry about the awful nature of Hell's creatures. Way out on Earth's moon, likely well before the events of Doom, two marines and a scientist, Stan Blaskovich, Kira Morgan and Riley O'Connor fought their way through yet another hell-infested Union Aerospace Corporation base. On their path, they were mocked by computer terminals as they interacted with them. It was apparent that this demon invasion not only took place in the physical world, but also the virtual. As they progressed, they learned of the Vios, the virtual icon of sin. Just like its previous iterations, although digital, the creature held immense power and was able to rip tears in space to create portals for demons to flood through. Before the population of the base could take it down, they had to fight it in a virtual space, and then, eventually, they destroyed its physical form. Upon its defeat, it turned to rubble and dust, and just like many other wars, this one was over. That would be until the UAC wanted to experiment with their gateway technology in the future. Across space and time, and some believe even into a new timeline, there was another species that would soon discover the denizens of hell. Or should I say, the denizens of hell would soon discover them. The Argenta of Argent Deneur were a strong species with many cities, great technologies and culture. They had once worshipped the elemental wraith whose wraith call had brought back life to a dead planet and given the Argenta the tools to thrive and fight off the aggressive beasts of the land. For many years, the Argenta grew, cultivated the land and expanded their control of Argent Deneur. Worship of the Wraith was at an all-time high and an army formed of the strongest of the Argenta, the Night Sentinel. This army used the essence of the Wraith to aid them in battle to not only defend against the evils of Argent Deneur, but it also protected the Wraith if needed. It appeared that the Argenta could survive on their own, and so the Elemental Wraith went to sleep. Regardless of the preparation the Elemental Wraith had put in place for this civilization, the Argenta felt abandoned and struggled against bandit attacks and natural disasters. Then, the Maker species arrived from the skies. The Angelic Maker were almost godlike beings. They came from Erdak, a place other worlds called Heaven, and aided the Father, who other worlds called God. 
The Maker offered the Argenta a place in this heavenly realm upon their deaths of their physical form, and new technologies to thrive and advance as a civilization in return for their worship. The Argenta felt ignored and abandoned by the elemental wraith and turned their backs on them to worship the Maker. The Night Sentinels, however, continue to honour their defence of the Wraith as well as watch over the Maker. Following this important moment in Argenta history, Argent Deneur boomed and prospered as new technologies revolutionised not only their planet, but it also allowed them to expand out into the universe. On various planets, they created settlements and spread the word of the Maker. For years, Argent Deneur prospered under the worship of the Maker, technology advanced and the Night Sentinel defended against any that sought harm. That was, until a human was discovered outside of the walls of Sentinel Prime during the reign of King Novik. This human was near death, he mumbled of impending doom and the forces of darkness. This marine had survived Phobos and hell on earth only to travel across space, time and dimensions. He had destroyed the Icon of Sin once and history was about to repeat itself. After the Maker and the Argenta learned to understand the marine's language, they tested his resolve in battle. He was naturally talented, talented enough to join the Night Sentinels under the watch of Commander Valen. The marine's warning of blood, guts and doom soon arrived as the demons of hell discovered Argent Deneur. This was the start of the unholy wars. Waves of demons flooded the land as the Night Sentinels got to work in defending the population. Commander Valen was brave, courageous and generally great at his job. He had trained these to the best of his ability, one of them was even his son, but they soon found that although they could cut down many of these abominations with ease, there was always another one behind it. They were relentless and appeared not to slow down. The Night Sentinels fought bravely against the constant waves of demons as the population hid in the cities with the Maker and the Argenta Priests. Death filled the battlefield as many Night Sentinels fell to the swarms. Valen still continued on, but then his son also fell to Hell's forces. Valen's once strong control over the Night Sentinels fell as he fought with the grief of the loss of his son. He lost his edge and was haunted by visions of his son being tortured. These were not mere visions, the souls of those lost on the battlefield were sent to hell and tortured to generate hell essence, the natural evil energy that powered hell's armies. Unknown to the population of Argent Deneur, during this long war, the leader of the Maker, the Khan Maker, and the Argenta priests had formed a pact with a Lord of Hell. They both used the souls of the fallen to generate energy in factories. The Maker even combined this Hell Essence with Wraith Essence to create Argent Energy, a powerful energy source that the Khan Maker needed to keep her species alive. The sacrifice of the Argenta was worth it in her eyes, Valen's son was just one of these souls. During another fight within the twisted landscapes of Hell, the Night Sentinels discovered one of the Maker factories that tortured and harvested souls. They saw the Maker design and realised what was actually happening. Upon their arrival back in Argent Deneur, they told the masses of what they had discovered, but this news was not believed by all. It split the population and a civil war began, so the Night Sentinels came up with a plan to stop the Maker. The first part of this plan was to wake the sleeping wraith to get their help, and the second part was to re-enter hell and destroy the soul spires that gave the Maker access to the Argent Energy. To ensure their success in the corruption of Argent Deneur, one of the Argentan priests, Daeg Grav, gave Commander Valen an offer he could not refuse. He confirmed that the visions of his son were real, he was in constant torture and pain, 
but he could stop this. He could not only ease the boy from eternal torment, but he could also resurrect him. All Valen had to do was betray the Night Sentinel and give the priests the keys to the Sepulchre of Elements, the sacred grounds of the sleeping elemental wraith. Valen agreed to these terms in the hopes his son would be returned to him. This act doomed Argent Deneur to the will of the Argenta Hell Priests and the Maker. The wraiths later were taken, chained, and their essence was extracted in order to power the unholy war. The boy had merely been a pawn for the Maker to get what they wanted. The Night Sentinel were completely unaware of this betrayal and entered Hell to destroy the Soul Spires. Upon their arrival, they found that the portal they had entered, controlled by the Agenta priests, had scattered them miles away from each other across the twisted landscapes of Hell. Valen also joined them, ashamed by his actions. Over the following hours, these night sentinels were swarmed and fell, one by one. That was until only the Marine turned Doomslayer and Commander Valen, now known as the Betrayer, stood strong. For many untold years, they stayed in Hell. Despite the Hell Priest's desperate conquest for power, Degrav held his promise to the Betrayer, just not in the way anyone would have expected. Throughout the universe and dimensions, there are higher gods and demons that appear to continue to live even after their physical forms have moved on. The Father, Davoth and the Spider Mastermind are just three of these. It is also believed that the majestic titan, the Icon of Sin, is also one of these higher tier demon lords. It went by many names and just waited to be resurrected. Its original form lay in Hell, and the Hell Priests and the Lords of Hell had a plan to bring it back. The Icon of Sin was resurrected and newly born from the heart of the Betrayer's son. It was given flesh by Hell's unholy design, forged from the essence of mortal suffering. This process had turned the fallen Night Sentinel into something new, but his soul was transmogrified and entombed within the still beating heart of the Icon of Sin. Commander Valen's son lived again, but now as the Icon, a titan of immense power, an inhumane existence. Some believe the Icon of Sin rose and helped in the destruction of Argent Deneur under the control of the Maker and Hell Priests, but no documentation completely supports this very likely suggestion. The once grand society of Argent Deneur fell slowly to the demonic invasion as chunks of the planet were absorbed into Hell itself. The Night Sentinels had failed, and thus, the demonic armies won the unholy wars. For many years, the Khan Maker relied on the Well, an energy source to generate Argent energy to sustain the lives of her species. However, the Doomslayer returned and unintentionally got in the way of her plans. The Slayer had been rescued from Hell by a human organization, the Union Aerospace Corporation, operating on Mars. History had repeated itself in this timeline, and the team here had discovered Hell and the demonic entities within. The Slayer fought through the UAC facility and shut down the well in Hell in order to stop this invasion. This angered the Khan Maker. In retaliation and in order to acquire new souls to generate Hell Essence, she ordered for the invasion of planet Earth. Despite a strong demonic invasion, the Khan Maker soon learned that the Doomslayer's rage was an extremely strong force. She had chosen the wrong planet to invade and slowly heard word of the deaths of her Hell Priests at his hands. Without these priests, the invasion halted and she decided to use the best weapon in her arsenal to take out Earth entirely before the Slayer could stop her. Since its resurrection, the Khan Maker had used Maker technology to not only enhance the Icon of Sin with protective armor, but also control it. 
This control came in the form of the manipulation of its heart. To finish off Earth, the Icon of Sin was brought to Erdak to perform the ritual of control. As a dormant being, it was safe to be around. On the other hand, when it was active, it was a threat to the existence of life itself. The mere presence of the Titan fractured reality, space and time around it. The longer it stayed in one spot, the more damage it did. It was a devourer of worlds, a being capable of generating a black hole that could drag entire planets and dimensions into the twisted realm of hell. Of course, the Khan Maker did not worry about this, she controlled its heart and with it, the creature was a valuable weapon. The Doomslayer on his journey had reunited with the Betrayer. Valen was aware of what his son had become and he offered the Slayer a knife to destroy his son's new form if he had the opportunity. Within Erdak, the Slayer raced to the Khan Maker to stop the ritual of the reawakening of the Icon of Sin to save humanity. The heart was an essential part of this and as soon as he entered the ritual chamber, he stabbed the heart with the blade the Betrayer had given to him. This however did not have the effect he expected. The destruction of the heart did not kill the Icon of Sin, it only released it from the control of the Khan Maker. Free, the Icon of Sin absorbed the essence of some of the Makers in this chamber and then turned to enter a portal to Earth. On Earth, the Titan wandered a fallen city. Its presence destroyed everything around it, but then it noticed the Doomslayer and a deadly battle began. The Icon used every ability at its disposal to destroy the human. It summoned demonic entities, fire and slammed its large fists onto the rooftop, but the Slayer evaded its attacks. It was protected at first by the armor the Maker had crafted for it, but this armor was slowly chipped away by the Slayer. Eventually, the Slayer managed to climb onto its head and plunge the blade of a crucible into its brain. And once again, the Icon of Sin fell at the hands of the Doomslayer. This action saved the population of Earth from eternal torment, freed the Betrayer's son and halted the lifespan of the Maker. As far as we know, the body of the Icon of Sin remained on Earth as the population attempted to rebuild. For now, this is where the story of the Icon of Sin ends. A titan of immense power taken down by a human marine. The Icon of Sin was one of the most powerful beings in the entire Doom timeline. It not only had the ability to rip tears in space to generate portals from different dimensions, but even its mere presence destabilized the space-time continuum. From the tablets written about this gigantic monstrosity, it is clear that it was a being that defied death after the fall of its physical body. With a crucible lodged in its brain and the fall of the Dark Lord, it is very likely this titan will not rise again. Imagine yourself worshipping before the Icon of Sin, in awe of its splendour, even as it sleeps till the call of ages come. This being was worshipped and seen as one of the greatest entities that had come from hell. A being that, just like many others, fell at the hands of the Doomslayer. The Icon of Sin may have failed, but it still holds a grand legacy that many of the other demons of the hellish realm of Jakkad still, even now, seek to reach. Here, we explore in the lore and story behind Dr. Malcolm Betruger in Doom 3. Many years ago, an ancient civilization thrived on Mars, believed to have been called the Praelantha. This species excelled in technology, religion and advanced weaponry as their species grew. 
Not a lot is known about these ancient Martians. What is known, however, is that they almost met their end as a result of their development and exploration of teleportation technology. A cycle that would appear to occur throughout many civilizations to come. In one of their ancient cities, the Martians managed to open up a portal into another dimension. Unfortunately, it was too late before they realised what they had done. The demons of hell wanted only to kill and inflict as much suffering as they could, and soon, they flooded onto Mars and a war between dimensions began. The Prey Lantha fought as hard as they could, but even with the advanced technology and weaponry they had developed, they found themselves on the losing side of this battle. It quickly became apparent that no matter how many demons they killed, more always came. Then, the scientists had an idea and began to develop a different type of weapon they could use. The technology of the ancient Martians was much different to what we consider technology today, and in order to forge this weapon, many of the few survivors of this massacre were sacrificed in a ritual. From this, their souls were forged into the Soul Cube a powerful device that grew stronger through the destruction of evil. Throughout this war, the Martians also discovered how the demons had been able to invade Mars. They made use of an artifact they called the Heart of Hell. In the hopes this would stop the invasion, the Martians managed to capture the artifact and sealed it away in a secret chamber. Yet, this did not stop the war. In their final stand against the forces of hell, a hero charged towards the portal with the soul cube and used it to seal the connection between dimensions. The hero did not survive this, but their actions stopped the war. The Prey Lantha later buried the hero, their dead, the artifacts they had developed, and finally, left a warning to those who came across the ruins of their civilization of the dangers of teleportation technology. As for the survivors, it is believed that they left Mars, found Earth, and became our descendants. On Mars, what remained fell to ruin, and within Hell, the demons grew to fear the Soul Cube and its power as they continued to attempt to break through into new dimensions. Many years later, by around 2100, the Union Aerospace Corporation travelled to Mars. The UAC were the largest corporation on planet Earth and used their almost unlimited funds to explore weaponry, defence contracts, and on Mars, they found that they could work outside of the moral and legal obligations that restricted them on Earth. And so, on their newly developed Mars City, the team here expanded their work into biological research, space exploration, and soon, something much more advanced. On their team was Dr. Malcolm Betruga, his title being the Director of All Research. His bright mind, leadership, and genuine interest in Mars allowed the UAC to thrive on this planet over the years. Then, in 2115, the team here discovered something interesting just under Mars's surface. The ruins of an ancient civilization they estimated to be possibly thousands or millions of years old. By around 2140, the UAC had set up support bases in order to explore three sites. Here, they came across many stone tablets full of information and ancient artifacts. Dr. Betruga worked with his team to decipher these to see what they could learn from the ancient Martians and what had happened to them. Although Betruga had given years of his life to this company, he grew frustrated with the board of the UAC. From his perspective, they cared only about money, not the science he had dedicated his life to. 
The discoveries on Mars had allowed his team to expand their workload and explore new areas of technology. They were exhausted and overworked. This had also led to many accidents. He simply wanted the board to give him more staff and a bigger budget so that his team could work more efficiently with the unethical experiments they performed. In their study of the remains of the Martians, the team discovered what remained of their teleportation technology. With these, humanity essentially reinvented teleportation under the leadership of Dr. Petruga. Petruga had dedicated his life to the UAC, and this achievement under his expertise should have been what he was remembered for. Without him, this would not have been possible. This was an exciting field of study, teleportation. Petruga pushed his team to recreate the technology of the ancient Martians. He took pride in his work and pushed those below him to work as hard as he did. He demanded perfection and grew a strong disdain for those who did not give everything they had. His co-workers admired his drive to work so tirelessly in the pursuit of science, but they also feared for his and his team's health. By Betruga's side was Ian McCormack, a research specialist. For the next year, the team set up a functional teleportation system. Alongside this, within the caverns, another team discovered another ancient artifact, the Soul Cube, an item that the Martian tablets had referred to. Only at this point, the team had not decoded what it had been used for. Over in Delta Labs, Malcolm and Ian were amazed at how well their experiments went. They, with the help of the Martian tablets, had discovered a new field of science. Betruga did have a reputation for his obsessive need for perfection. To Ian, however, this attitude had pushed Betruga to excel, and as a result, had allowed Ian to work on such an amazing project. For around their first 12 experiments with their teleporters, they sent through various objects and watched as they appeared in the desired exit locations. From this, they learned that the teleportation technology essentially broke down the objects at a quantum level, transported them and then reassembled them. Regardless of this groundbreaking development, Ian soon found an issue. From the designs and his work, he believed that this process should have been instantaneous, but it was not. There was a delay. To investigate this, the team decided to send through a video drone to capture the experience from the perspective of the object going through. Upon their retrieval of the footage, Ian and Betruga made a huge discovery. The footage showed as the drone moved from location A to location B, but during this delay they had noticed, the team found a few frames of a different location between with several sets of eyes looking at the camera. A different realm with living, breathing creatures. This was yet another breakthrough in Petruga's work on Mars. Not only had he been responsible for the development of teleportation technology, but his efforts had also led to the discovery of a different dimension with new beings. To explore this, Betruga called for volunteers to enter this dimension and bring back the creatures for study. This was new territory for humanity, and the device had not been tested for human use. This was Betruga's greatest work, and it became clear that he cared only for the advancement of his scientific pursuit, and not for the possible side effects of human use of the teleporter. To acquire medical clearance for human use, Ian McCormack doctored several reports for the board to explain that multiple experiments had been conducted with living tissue, and thus, it was safe. With this clearance, members of the UAC security force were sent through. These would not only be able to explore the dimension, but also bring back subjects from within by force. At first, this process appeared to be successful. More and more subjects were collected and studied by the UAC team. From these, Betruga learned more about this realm. 
Ian, however, soon noticed that when the UAC security team returned from the other dimension, they were found to act unstable and irritable. On one occasion, one soldier attempted to chew off his own fingers. Something was wrong about this whole project. Despite this, Betruga ordered for the operation to continue. Every two days, new teams were sent in. Each time they returned, they reported what they had experienced within, nightmarish creatures and sightings. Eventually, Ian and the team realised that this was not just a normal dimension, it was hell, and the creatures they had captured for study were demons. This did not disturb Betruga. He cared only about his own pursuits. Human life was a sacrifice that had to be made for the exploration of this dimension. Not everything was as it appeared to be. Betruga's obsession with Hell had seemingly formed a connection between him and the entities within. He had found something much greater than himself and the human population of Mars. Something bad was on the way. Humanity had repeated the mistakes that the ancient Martians had made many, many years before. The team worked on the Martian tablets and discovered their warnings of teleportation, demons and the hero that had closed the connection between dimensions. The teleportation experiments had however already been ongoing for the past year. In 2145, Dr. Petruga was contacted by a demonic force. He was told of the power of the soul cube his team had discovered in one of the ancient Martian sites, and that he could trade this cube for power and immortality. The hellish corruption was strong in Petruga, and with this offer available, Malcolm entered a portal to hell. Ian McCormack watched as this happened. This was an unscheduled trip and no one could stop him from entering. McCormack waited for his boss to come back, confused on what had occurred. Inside of hell, Petruga was offered a meeting with the demons. They feared the soul cube and offered the scientists the power to control an army of demons and immortality if he allowed them access to Mars through a portal and the soul cube. Petruga accepted this offer and returned back to Mars to complete his side of the bargain. McCormack and the rest of this small team noticed instantly that Petruga was different. He looked and sounded like their boss, but there was something off about him. Dr. Petruga believed he had made the correct decision. The constant micromanagement from the UAC board had forced him to take drastic action to explore hell. A meeting with Counselor Elliot Swan only confirmed this for him after he was questioned about the consistent accidents and transfer requests from the facility. Elliot had been sent to investigate what had happened here, and he was not satisfied with Betruga's answers. Regardless, Betruga had more important things to do, in which he ended his meeting with Counselor Swan with, Amazing things will happen here soon, just you wait. Shortly after, Betruga stole the soul cube and re-entered hell. Within, he handed over the cube, the one weapon that had kept the demons at bay. Before Ian McCormack and his team could warn the rest of the facility of Betruga's actions, the portals across the facility activated and out flooded hordes of demonic entities. With a demonic army under his control, Betruga got to work to prepare for the next phase of the invasion. He, however, was met with some resistance. Elliot Swan sent through units across the facility to take out the demons, but they were quickly overwhelmed by their numbers. This invasion also had a huge side effect on many of the population. They developed zombie-like traits, grew irritable and attacked anything they saw on site, just like the security units that had travelled through into hell to capture the creatures within. 
Betruger noticed that there was one marine that had just arrived before the invasion that seemed to be unaffected by the demons he encountered. He appeared to survive against the waves of demons that appeared before him and travelled across the facility under the command of Sergeant Thomas Kelly to send out a distress call to Earth for reinforcements. If the marine chose not to send out this call, Betruger did it instead. Eventually, through a video call, Malcolm explained that he was responsible for this entire invasion. The fleet that was on its way to save Mars would be the perfect method to spread the hell invasion to Earth. Without a need for the marine, over the following hours, Betruga attempted to murder him through multiple methods, toxic gas, hordes of demons, and after many failed attempts, he even activated a portal to pull the marine into hell in the hopes he would be trapped there. Betruga's invasion appeared to be going to plan at first, but the marine soon began to defy his expectations. Not only did this marine discover the soul cube, but he also escaped hell with it and sealed the portal behind him. To counter this, Betruga, with his new power, opened a hell hole in the caverns of the ancient Martian sites so that this invasion could continue. Once again, Betruga was angered by the actions of the marine as he entered the caverns. In hell, the effects of his connection to the demons amplified as he sent more forces to fight against the marine that would just not die. The rescue fleets were close, he just had to keep the portal open until they arrived. Despite his best efforts to stop the actions of the marine, Betruga soon realised that his plan had failed. The marine fought with a cyber demon and used the power of the soul cube to seal the final portal between hell and Mars. As Betruga had found himself within hell when the portal was sealed, he discovered that he was trapped there. His actions had led to the mass death of the entire population of Mars. His plan had almost been successful. It was just the actions of one marine that had got in his way. Dr. Malcolm Petruger had joined forces with the demonic entities of hell, and in his new home, he became a part of this immortal population. He essentially shed his human body and became a part of something greater. Betruga became the Maledict, a deadly skeletal wyvern. What remained of Betruga's original form was his head, which appeared to have been fused to the tongue of the creature. Over his time in hell, Betruga learned as much as he could about his new home and its history. For over a year and a half, Betruga served in Hell's armies as one of its strongest creatures. On Mars, the UAC sent out a new research expedition to explore the ruins of the ancient Martians. One of these teams discovered a new artifact in a secret chamber, the Heart of Hell. Upon the touch of the artifact, a marine accidentally reawakened it, and as a result, a connection between Hell and Mars opened once again. Almost instantly, Betruga used his power to invade Mars. He was aware of the power of the artifact and sent through Hell Hunters and hordes of lower demons to retrieve it. The marine that had activated the artifact showed just as much combat ability as the marine that had defeated Betruga's original plan. He defeated the Hell Hunters and absorbed their souls into the artifact. Upon doing so, he entered Hell with it, with the plan to destroy destroy it. In Betruga's realm, he berated the marine. This human was mortal, he was nothing in comparison to him. Betruga, the maledict, referred to himself as us, likely as he was connected to a much greater power. 
His children were his demons, and as a collective entity with Hell, he made it his mission to stop this marine. Despite this, the marine pushed forward and searched for a way to destroy the heart, and thus end the invasion. Betruger, however, tracked down the marine and fought him in his new, powerful form. Although the marine had the power of the artifact and an array of weapons, he was knocked out by Betruger. When the human woke up, Betruger ordered that he hand over the artifact, that he return what was theirs. Stolen by the ancient Martians thousands or millions of years before, the scientist that had betrayed his own species was no longer human. He hoped to use the artifact to lead a new invasion. In this tense moment, the marine shoved the artifact into the mouth of Betruger as he spoke. Instantly, the artifact exploded and had an instant effect on Betruger's body. His new, maledict form disintegrated into nothing. And so too did what was left of his human form. All that remained of Dr. Malcolm Betruger was a human skull, and thus, another hell invasion of Mars was stopped by a nameless marine. Dr. Malcolm Betruger gave his life and dedication to a company that appeared to care only about profit. He was overworked and genuinely passionate about his field of study. He was the villain of this story, and yet, the board of the UAC were, in a way, responsible for the treatment of their staff, and as such, his actions. He was offered an opportunity to escape the life and work environment he hated by a demonic force and became something new, the Maledict. Betruga's time with the demonic forces of Hell lasted only for a year and a half. His actions, however, led to the deaths of hundreds of people. In this rare occasion in the Doom universes, we know the fate of Dr. Malcolm Betruga, and in another timeline, it would appear that other scientists would also make the same mistakes he did. Here, we explore in the lore and story behind the legendary, godlike wraith species in the Doom series. Many, many years ago, the planet of Argent Deneur was nothing but an almost barren rock that floated in space. In this seemingly timeless state, the planet was hit by a giant shard that had travelled across space. Even now, no one knows where the spear came from or if it was planned to hit Argent Deneur. But upon impact, it tore through the core of the planet, pole to pole, and became a permanent fixture. This impact ripped apart the skies as thunder and cataclysmic earthquakes devoured the land. This was the arrival of the elemental wraith species. From the outside, it appeared that this giant object was merely a spear that had impacted the planet. However, inside, it was clear that this was actually a very advanced spaceship that had been designed by Bright Minds. Along the edges, cryo chambers housed thousands of creatures and kept them alive as they slept during their long journey. These creatures would go on to be called by many names. The Wraith, the Firstborn, or just gods to name a few. From their appearance, the Wraith looked like an amalgamation of many separate species that would later be discovered on planet Earth. These tall life forms resembled almost a human face, horns, tentacles, crab-like legs, and enormous wings. The impact of the Wraith ship, also known as the World Spear, had resulted in mass destruction to the surface of Argent Deneur. However, this powerful species had a job to do. Almost instantly, power emanated from the spear and mutated the plant life and vegetation around it into new life forms, stunning forests, and various other booming biomes. As this energy seeped into the environment, the wraith woke from their slumber and left the ship. In waves, the creatures flew across the planet and looked at what Argent Deneur could be. 
The wraith emanated the same remarkable power the world spear did, and their breath restored the damaged land. As the forest flourished, the skies settled, the oceans welcomed new life, and this once inhospitable planet became home to life. Over time, their wraith call echoed and continued to echo across the land, from the frozen continents to the sizzling deserts. This was essentially a new world, and with it came the first dominant species, now known as the Ancestrals. These creatures had lived through Argent Deneur's period of desolation as it became a flourishing land, and as such, had adapted quickly. They had, in a sense, been born and invigorated with the magic of the Wraith, and they reflected this. The Ancestrals grew exponentially, and as most species do in their early years, attempted to gain dominance and territory, so they attacked the other creatures born from the land. For years, wars between these large, feral beasts tore apart the mountains and valleys that the Wraith had brought back to life. Of course, the Wraith were sentient and understood that these animals did not understand the work they had put into the reconstruction of the planet, but this was not what they had planned for Argent Deneur. Regardless, they did not intervene directly. This was how life started on most planets they just had to wait for an intelligent species to emerge. For an unknown amount of time, the Wraith Call continued to echo across the planet as more life formed. Then, in the dry, grassy plains of Argent Deneur, the first Argenta rose. This seed of intelligent life grew, and over the years, they studied their environment, farmed the plains for food, and most importantly, learned to avoid the constant ancestral war around them. This was what the Wraith had waited for. As the first of the Argenta people grew and adapted to survive in a war zone of towering ancestrals, they learned how to construct swords of steel strong enough to cut through flesh and pierce bone. In their mountain forges, they beat steel in the darkness as they prepared to form armies for both defense and offensive maneuvers. Through practice and study of their world, they taught their younger members of the ancestrals and the hold they had over Argent Deneur. To live in peace, they needed to remove these creatures, so they continued to train and eventually, the Wraith made themselves known to the Argenta. This formed a new era, the Time of Man. As godlike beings with incredible powers, the Wraith blessed the Argenta with their divine power and taught them some of their magics and abilities. In return, the Argenta worshipped the Wraith as their gods. Over countless years and wars, the armies of Argent Deneu went out into the world armed with their swords, shields, armor, and power of the Wraith. With this incredible power, these armies fought with and drove back the divine beasts into the bleak valleys, far away from civilization. During these tough times, sentinel shamans of the tribes of Argent Deneur approached the World Spear and discovered that the entrance was guarded by entities known as the Gatekeepers. These silent spirits watched over the entrance and judged those who approached. These had existed ever since the Spear had crashed into the planet. For those deemed worthy, they were offered a piece of the Spear, a crystal of immense power. When brought back to their communities, this energy source allowed them to advance their technological developments immensely. However, for those deemed unworthy by the spirits, they were struck down. The Wraith had gifted the Argenta with a new way of life, and in return, they worshipped them and took care of the land. Over the years, the new dominant species of Argent Deneur bred animals to help them farm the fertile lands, developed new contraptions and technologies, built towering cities, formed governments to manage and increase the growth of the many newly developed settlements across the planet, and even crowned their first king, King Omero, on the Obsidian Throne. From the World Spear, the Wraith watched this growth and saw how this species cared for the land in comparison to the feral ancestrals that had sought only to dominate and destroy. To pay their respects to the firstborn, 
the Argentans constructed the Cathedral of Reflection, and inside, they formed the Order of Deg, a holy group of three priests who communed with the wraith and relayed their wishes to the population. Over time, society grew and the sons and daughters of Argent Deneur were offered two paths of duty to honour the wraith, sword or alchemy. Their whole society was structured around the worship of the divine beings that had allowed them to fight against the terrifying ancestrals years before. However, although the majority of the population had joined this grand society, they still suffered hardships. The Wraith watched over the population from their spear and offered them blessings when they could, but there were still lessons to teach them. Their guidance from afar had turned the early Argentans into great warriors and to keep them strong, they did not intervene when the occasional tragic events occurred. Strife, great storms, earthquakes and various other natural disasters struck this population and killed many as Argentan architecture was destroyed. Despite these catastrophes, the population came together to rebuild and console those who had lost something or someone. This in turn allowed them to build back up much stronger to fight against the other issues that arose in a civilization one of which were the brutal tribes outside of the cities that plundered and pillaged any unprotected region they could. Even though the Wraith Call had led to the rebirth of Argent Deneur and the rise of countless new species many, many years before, it still echoed across the land. It was said that when lesser men heard this song, it drove them to madness and allowed the strongest and most resilient of the Argenta to strengthen even more. In the face of these disasters and barbaric attacks, the strongest rose. Their resolve hardened, the fire strengthened their souls and their will became unbreakable. For the strongest of the strong of Argenta, they formed an army, the Night Sentinels. An army that fought for and defended the wraith and safety of their species above all else. A threat could appear at any time, so the wraith blessed the night sentinels with their wraith energy. This, alongside their strong will, made them almost indestructible against the forces they came up against. Outside of the world spear, night sentinels then stood guard to protect the wraith that had gone back to sleep after they had completed their work. The population worshipped the wraith, however, they were unsure on where they had come from. Some theorised that they had lived in the centre of the planet and the crash of the spear had released them, while others were correct in the belief that they had arrived with the spear. Regardless, as they never entered the world spear, they were unaware that this was a ship that had travelled from somewhere else in space. Moving forward an untold amount of years, the Wraith continued to sleep and allowed the Argenta people to live on. During the period now known as the Time of Grief, King Etrex was anointed as the new ruler, and in this new era, a great change came to Argent Deneur, the arrival of the Maker species. These angelic beings came from the skies and looked at the Argenta and saw just how far they had come. After they introduced themselves, they told the story of where they had come from and what they could offer. The Maker came from the realm of Erdak. This realm went by many names in other cultures, Heaven, the Eternal Resting Place and the Home of God just to name a few. They held the power and technology to move through space and time where they held dominion over many worlds and dimensions. They were ancient, powerful beings invulnerable to the weapons of the Argenta and they were here to help. If the population of Argent Deneau worshipped them, the Maker would in return give them new knowledge, order, technology, safety, power and even the ability for their souls to live on eternally in the heavenly realm of Erdak after their physical form gave up. Although the Wraith had granted the Argenta many gifts and power to grow as a species and civilization, their distance and refusal to stop the natural disasters and various other issues that plagued the Argenta made this offer very tempting. To help his people, 
King Etrex accepted the offer of the Maker, and as such, many turned their backs on the Wraith and adopted the holy doctrine of the Maker as they worshipped them in their temples. A new age began on Argent de Neu as the Wraith slept. An age of warmth and spiritual prosperity flourished as the population said goodbye to the harsh, unforgiving and uncertain future under the Wraith. However, the Night Sentinel, while they had accepted the Maker as their new gods, still continued their tribute and service to the Wraith. For some, this was seen as a betrayal to the Wraith species, while for others, this was the best direction the Argentans could have gone in for a better future. Over the ages, the Wraith slept as the Order of Deg worked alongside the Maker to lead the species. The Argentans grew and used Maker technology to build advanced spaceships to explore new planets under the banner of the Maker to spread their word. Each planet liberated added increased security to Ardenur as a new potential threat was removed before it could even grow. However, in a different dimension, a new threat was rising, and the Khan Maker, the leader of the species, was aware of it. In the Fourth Age, during the reign of King Novik, this threat came to Argent Dunur, and it was nothing like they had faced before. As portals opened across the planet, waves of demonic entities flooded from the dimension of hell onto this prosperous land. This was the start of the Unholy Wars. In this chaos, the Night Sentinel stepped in and attempted to protect the main cities such as Taris Nabad and Sentinel Prime, but constant waves of demons overwhelmed even them. The planet suffered huge casualties right from the beginning. To their luck, just before the demons had discovered Argent Deneur, an outlander was found just outside the city walls of Sentinel Prime. He had fought with these entities before, and he was a skilled warrior. This earned him a spot in the Night Sentinels. Even with the Doomguy's strength and combat ability, the Night Sentinels barely managed to keep the demons at bay. However, behind the scenes, sinister actions were being performed. The Khan Maker and Order of Daeg sought to understand the power of the demonic invaders, and upon study, they learned that they used a power source that they dubbed Hell Essence. This came from the torture and torment of the poor souls sent to Hell. The Khan Maker wanted to not only win this war, but also use a power source to prolong the lives of the Maker. So, she tasked those around her to increase the power of Hell Essence. In secret, they soon learned that if Hell Essence was combined with the power of the Wraith, it formed an incredibly substantial power source. This was enough to power the weaponry for the war, and to help the Maker species live longer. As this had been discovered on Argent Deneur, they named this energy source Argent Energy. The Wraith had helped this planet and its population thrive. Their essence, or magic, was essentially a force of good. It naturally spread seeds of life and power into the environment. The Khan Maker had combined this with an energy of a completely opposite nature. Cruel, torturous, and death. For those that accepted this new form of energy, they discovered that they also too were gifted with longer lives, immunity to illness, and various other benefits. Despite this, the Night Sentinels felt that something was off about this miraculous new discovery, and refused to participate in it. The Khan Maker came to rely on Argent Energy, but she soon discovered that she needed to create a fresh supply of both Wraith Essence and Hell Essence to continue its production. To combat this, she ordered for the construction of secret factories in Hell to harvest Hell Essence. These factories essentially tormented and tortured the souls of the fallen Argenta that had fought in the war. On the battlefield, Commander Valen of the Night Sentinels watched as his son fell to the demons. In his grief, he was plagued by visions of the torment of his son, and this broke him. In this vulnerable state, 
Deg Grav of the Order of Deg came to him under the orders of the Khan Maker. He confirmed that his son was in fact being tortured, but there was something he could do to save him. All he had to do were two things. The first, offer the key to the sepulchre of elements, and secondly, open the vault of the slumbering wraiths. Desperate to save his son, he agreed and allowed the Khan Maker access to the wraiths. Following this, the elemental wraiths were taken and imprisoned within hell. Here, they were corrupted as their essence was extracted as they lay helpless, unable to free themselves. All of this in secret, but this secret did not last for too long. Despite this new energy source, the unholy wars continued. On a trip to hell to fight the demons within, a group of night sentinels discovered one of the factories that the Khan Maker had set up, and they learned of the dark secrets of what had happened to the souls of the lost and their ancient wraiths. They quickly returned to Argent de Neur and explained to the masses of what they had found. This information split the population and a civil war began. On one side, they refused to believe that the Maker had built factories that relied on the torture of the Fallen. They were here to help and protect them. On the other side, they sided with the Night Sentinels and returned to the worship of the Wraith. Regardless of the civil war, the unholy war still raged on and the sentinels still went out to protect the whole population. However, they still came up with a plan. The night sentinels needed to achieve two feats to bring down the Khan Maker and her hold of Argent de Neur. The first stage of their plan required them to re-enter hell and destroy the soul spire. If they could do this, it would destroy the energy connection from the factories. If they could achieve this, their next task would be to enter the world spear and wake up the rest of the sleeping wraiths so that they could help them in their time of need. Unfortunately, they failed on the first step of this mission. The Night Sentinels approached the Order of Deg and asked for their help. Unknown to them, the priest had secretly worked with the Khan Maker to create the factories. When the Sentinels revealed their plan to them, the priest feigned cooperation and offered them access to hell. As the Night Sentinels entered the portal, they discovered that they had been tricked by the priests and were scattered across the twisted landscape. One by one, they were picked off by swarms of demons until just one of them, the Outlander, lived. He put the fear into the demons as he wiped them out. That was until he was trapped inside of a sarcophagus and he could do no harm to the demons and the demons could do no harm to him. For an untold number of years, the essence of the wraith was extracted from them as they lay trapped in hell. This demonic war proceeded to tear Argent de Neur apart as whole regions of the planet were consumed by hell. Without the Night Sentinel, those who continued to worship the Wraith fell. Soon, the lands filled with pain and the population dropped. It was as if those early years of the planet had come back. Those who survived moved to the isolated regions of the planet and attempted to start a new life. Over in hell, the well of energy remained active and pushed through the terrible power of Argent energy as the wraith lay there in torment. Many years later, over in the Milky Way galaxy on Mars, the outlander that had become a night sentinel woke up to find himself in yet another war with the demonic entities of hell. Over the next few hours, he learned that he had been saved from his fate in hell by a human company, the UAC. The Doomslayer still wanted revenge on those that had betrayed himself, the Wraith and the Night Sentinels, and with the help of Dr. Samuel Hayden, the Slayer re-entered hell and discovered the well. A heinous device created by the Khan Maker in which it absorbed the power from the Wraith. For each wraith he found, he severed their connection from this power source and closed down the well, and with it, the Maker's awful power source. 
Even through this, the death and torture of the rest of their kind did not wake the elemental wraith in stasis. The Doomslayer had done them a great service, and the majority of the species were still completely unaware. The elemental wraith species had travelled across space for an unknown reason. Regardless of whether they had planned to land on Argent de Neu or if they had simply crashed, these almost godlike beings made a great change to a planet and, through their actions, brought forth a prominent civilization. The Argenta, and one of the strongest armies in the universe, the Night Sentinels. As he continued his journey, the Doomslayer returned to Argent de Neu once again and was granted worthy by the gatekeepers of the World Spear to enter. From this, he acquired a piece of the spear itself in order to power an ancient gateway created by the Father, another powerful being. He had, in a way, repeated what the old shamans of Argent de Neu had done many years before, in which they had sought power and brought it back to their tribes. As for the Wraith, after this point, it is unknown what happened to them. Did they continue to sleep or did they eventually wake up from their long slumber to discover the devastation that had occurred in their absence? Following the later actions of the Doomslayer, when they did eventually wake up, they would have no Heavenly Father, no Devil and no dominant angelic maker left leaving them pretty much the last known powerful creatures in the universe. Here, we explore the lore and story behind the Maker species in Doom. As Davoth, the first primeval being wandered across the void, the realm of Erdak sprang from him. A heavenly realm that would become one of the most influential and important locations until the end of time. This being had created his second realm in order to aid his first, the realm of Jakkad, and with it, he created a new species, the Maker. The Maker were quick to learn about their home realm, and as their language advanced, they took the name of Erdak to mean paradise or heaven. This realm had also been created to exist in an anchor state, a realm always inverted to Jakkad. What existed between them was up to Davoth to decide. In their paradise, the Maker species thrived. At the top of their hierarchy was the Khan Maker, a supreme leader that led her entire species. This was the most important of the Maker at any time, and her creation was something of legend. To control the evolution of the Maker, the Khan was created in a process called the Singularity. Although still shrouded in mystery, what is known is that the Singularity had several lesser Maker fused together with the essence of their god to form a Khan. In doing so, the soul data of every major Maker that had ever lived or died was combined to form the optimal leader, destiny bound to lead her species through the next age. This process was not without its limitations. The singularity did have to occur once every 10,000 Earth years, otherwise there would be no evolution of the species and the Khan would fall to corruption, mental and physical decay. Under the Khan in the Maker hierarchy were the Seraphs, local advisors of Erdak. Below them were Maker Angels, speakers and watchers for the Khan and at the bottom were Maker Drones, almost the children of the realm, too vulnerable to leave Erdak. This species were all led by the Khan Maker. They also existed within a neural matrix, almost like a hive mind in which the Khan Maker sent out her commands to the rest of her species. These individuals did have their own thoughts and desires, however, they could not refuse an order from their Khan. Davoth had created Erdak and the Maker species for a reason. His first realm of Jakkad was, in his view, superior to Erdak. Within the lands of bounty and prosperity, he had gifted the citizens there with burning ambition without restraint. Yet, in all of his power, he could not cure them of their curse of mortality. 
He was immortal, but could not find a way to replicate this on his first creations. He loved them, and it pained him that he could not help them. So, the creation of the Maker and their machine-like hive mind was his solution to the problem. They would find the secrets of immortality for him. With this request, the Khan Maker and her species got to work. In their search, they uncovered the secrets and mysteries of the realms. They developed incredible technologies and machinery, and Erdak developed into a hub of knowledge and amazement. The Maker themselves were also a creation of Davoth, and they too suffered the same mortal limitations as the denizens of Jakkad. They had been crafted with a much longer lifespan, and this allowed them to all work together to seek out this cure. For many years, the Maker worked on the discovery of the cure of mortality, and eventually, they found it. Over this period of time, they looked upon Davoth and Jakkad and watched as their lord and creator fell from grace. The death of his creations had taken a toll on the god, he grew cruel and bitter. He feared that he would ultimately end up alone and punish those in Jakkad who failed to actively seek out this cure. This behaviour scared the Maker, and they decided to act in order to save themselves, the new realms between Erdak and Jakkad, and ultimately, all life itself from his wrath. The complex, almost machine-like matrix of the Maker hive mind was incredibly powerful. It had the ability to predict every variable of every possible future timeline. With this knowledge, the species surveyed these timelines and decided what was best for themselves and the realms. Although there were almost infinite possibilities, they saw that Davoth was a danger to the future. To protect them, the Makers worked together and, with their incredible power that almost rivaled Davoth's, they formed a seal around the realm of Jakkad. In doing this, he and his denizens were trapped there and the realms outside were safe from his rage. Having done what they believed to be the best for the rest of existence, the Maker returned to Erdak and continued to thrive. They often visited the earthly realms and continued to explore and attempt to understand the realms. Their research into life and death had led them to the discovery of life spheres, a sphere that contained the memory, intelligence, will and essential nature of a being's consciousness, an object they could use used to expand their own lifespans. Within Jakkad, Davoth had not taken his betrayal lightly. The servant race he had crafted had turned against him, and he planned to do everything in his power to get his revenge. Consumed by his fury, his rage spread out into the entirety of Jakkad. The clear watered pleasure lake spoiled into the blood swamps, the palace of groans grew over the Ardenite gardens, and the population once full of hope that Davoth had loved so much twisted into malevolent demonic entities. As for Davoth, he transformed into the Dark Lord. The Maker at first believed they had contained this problem. However, Davoth's anger did not fade over time. It instead increased, and he threw all of his power against the walls of his prison, and cracks formed into the earthly dimensions. From Erdak, the Maker watched as demonic hordes flooded through, murdered and tortured innocents. So, they decided they had to act again. With all of their power, the warriors of Erdak re-entered Jakkad and they fought against Davoth and his twisted population. At the height of this conflict, Davoth fought against the Maker at the top of the Pyramid of the Lost, and in one quick motion, one of his opponents ripped out the life sphere of the Dark Lord. Instantly, Davoth the Dark Lord's lifeless body tumbled to the bottom of the pyramid as the One Brave Maker held the life sphere of his creator in his hand. This fear was what remained of Davoth, and as he held it in his hands, Davoth's power flowed into this Maker and transformed him into something new. He was elevated in every way. He became a god and the new ruler of all. 
To the maker, he was referred to as the father. At his side, a seraph, Sama Maker, begged the father to shatter the life sphere of Davoth. Despite all of the pain he had caused, the father could not bring himself to destroy his maker. Instead, the father travelled to the blood swamps and rose high above to the Temple of Souls to store the sphere. This region did exist within Hell. It was, however, constructed on top of a fragment of Erdak. To end this conflict and chaos once and for all, the father used his new powers and formed another holy seal. This protected Erdak from any of Jakkad from entering or stepping foot on the Maker's realm, and it sealed the demons of Jakkad within their realm. Davoth had been sealed within Hell, but on a piece of Erdak. This meant that all he could do was wait and plot within his fear. His creatures, unable to step foot on the land he was trapped on. This was a completely new age for the Maker. Not only were they free from the demonic corruption of Hell, but they also had a new leader, the Father. Once one of their own, elevated into a completely new level. The Father was a strict but fair leader. He wanted to create new realms and worlds for civilizations to grow and thrive. The Maker wanted to help these new species, and so, they developed interdimensional slipgate teleporters to travel into the earthly realms to meet and guide them. By the Father's side were the Seraph. They helped him in his work and assisted in his research. Despite their importance, after an unknown incident during the Battle of Isencast, the Father stripped the Seraph of their wings. In atonement, they built the Luminarium. The Seraph were responsible for the many marvels of the Maker species, machines that even contained the terrible energies of the very essence of life. Just under the cornerstones of the Luminarium, quantum engines of creation stirred. These interdimensional structures span in and out of existence to form the energy needed for this place. Although the Seraph had attempted to atone for their actions, the Father ordered that all Seraph were to serve any who entered the Luminarium, with a code that ordered they serve all who arrived equally and favour none. The Luminarium became a very important location in Erdak, and it became closely linked to life spheres and their use. In the age of the first Calm Maker, she fell during the Siege of Khazadur. Her life sphere was quickly taken to the Luminarium and the Seraph used their incredible power of this place to restore her. Returned to her physical form and in full power, the Khan Maker led an army of Maker back in to battle. The Maker were a species that lived for a very long time, and their deaths were an awful experience. As they matured and fell closer to death, their bodies went through a process called the Transfiguration. This effectively put them through physical and mental degradation. To combat this, the Maker developed a new process that allowed them to voluntarily pass away and resurrect. In essence, it expanded their lives as long as they performed the process, a process that relied on the power of the Father to hold off Transfiguration as long as possible before they were reborn. The ages continued to pass as the Father created new worlds and life. The singularity occurred every 10,000 human years, and each time, the Maker species evolved for the better with the new knowledge and customs. The Father, of course, offered his power to allow this process to continue. Within the Earthly Realms, the Maker came across the planet of Argent Donneur. The population here did not fear these angelic beings that came from the skies, and they listened to what they had to say. The Argenta were amazed at first that no sword or shield could cut through their ethereal flesh. They moved through time and space with their almighty power. The Maker Angels offered the Argenta peace, 
prosperity and new technologies to help their civilization grow. They also offered a place for their undying souls to travel to upon the death of their mortal shell, a place in the heavenly realm of Erdak. All the Agenta had to do was worship them. The Maker had encountered countless species on their travels, and as almost immortal beings at this point, they looked down on the mortals they discovered. They became arrogant and believed they were better than them. They deserved to be worshipped. The Argenta already worshipped another god, but many of them felt that they had been abandoned. As a result of this, many turned their worship to the Maker, and as offered, as many years passed, the Maker Angels fulfilled their promises to this civilization in return for their worship. The Argenta boomed, they constructed grand cities, received the guidance of the Maker, and were taught the secrets of space flight. Out in the universe, the Argenta sought out new planets to settle on, and for other sentient life that they could spread the word of the Maker too, of how the Father had created the heavenly realm of Erdak, the earthly realms, and everything within creation. All he wanted was their worship a story slightly altered by the Maker to improve their image of what had actually happened. The Khan Maker split her time between realms, and was offered information by her Maker Angels that had settled on newly discovered planets of any developments. As they performed their duties well, they were offered orator rings as rewards. The more rings they had fused to their armour, the higher ranking they were. The Maker Drones performed their duties across Erdak, and the Seraph worked within the Luminarium. As aeons passed, the Father worked on the realms. He had created whole worlds with life, and he had even attempted to create gods to govern over the many realms he had crafted. But he soon became frustrated with his own divine errors, as some of these creations did not act in the way he expected them to. These errors were stored in the Temple of Souls. He also saw that Hell continued to slide into discordance, and he feared that if the creatures within did break free and managed to steal his power, it would destroy all of the hard work he had done. The father believed that he had done everything he could do in his time, and to monitor all of the realms with his full attention, he decided to withdraw from the physical realm. To do this, he asked his most loyal seraph, Sama, to transform him into a life sphere. Sama, of course, accepted the request of his leader, and he placed the father's life sphere within the Luminarium. For the ages to come, the Maker travelled to the Luminarium to pray to him, and used his essence in their rituals. For many, many years, the Maker guided the lesser species they encountered and word spread of their presence across the realms. Angels that offered a place in a heavenly realm in return for worship. Within the Luminarium, the Father's power was still used to allow the Maker to thrive. He, however, heard the whispers of the Dark Lord from his life sphere. Davoth was trapped within the Temple of Souls, but his presence wandered the realms. He sought out those who could be easily corrupted in order to influence them to do his bidding. The Father saw cracks form across the barriers of Hell, and asked that Sama Maker take his life sphere to somewhere no one would find it. Sama again obeyed the orders of his master, and he took the Father's sphere into the Temple of Souls. Here, he placed him next to Davoth. Only a being of high power could enter this place. The disappearance of the Father's life sphere spread panic across the whole of Erdak. They were vulnerable to the transfiguration once again, and the reigning Khan Maker had no way to retire. She had to reign until another Khan was born, yet this could not happen without the essence of the Father. It appeared that the Maker had no ability to extend their lifespan anymore. They had essentially become mortal. 
from those of the Maker that surveyed every possible future timeline, the Khan Maker was informed that one constant existed across all of them, that of a chosen one that would threaten her rule, someone that would bring an end to the Maker. The disappearance of the father, her mortality, and her need to stay in power opened her up to corruption. And then, she heard the whispers of the Dark Lord from his prison. Unaware that these were the whispers of the fallen god, the Khan Maker leaned into these whispers and used them to construct a machine that would help her discover this chosen one. The Divinity Machine was built within the Chapel of Purity in Taras Nabad, a holy city and the capital of Argent Danur. The Khan Maker told the Argenta that this machine would cleanse those who used it of their impurities. What she failed to mention was that during its construction, she had followed the guidance of the Dark Lord's whispers into the mountains of Enkremon to receive a piece of his essence in order to power the machine. Under her orders, for a purification ritual, the Argenta entered this machine. Upon its activation, it not only destroyed their physical bodies, but it also destroyed their souls. Generations later, during the time of King Novik on Argent Dunur, a human appeared. The Argenta had not encountered humanity and had no idea where he had come from. He rambled of blood, guts and demons, about a realm of darkness, horror and death. The Khan Maker resided on Argent Dunur during this time and she ordered her angels to decipher this language so that she could communicate with the Outlander. Upon learning his tongue, the Khan became intrigued by what he had encountered in Hell. This was a place of power, power that could save her species. The Outlander showed himself to be very capable in combat, and he later joined the strongest army on Argent Dunur, the Night Sentinels. This army had once fought for the old gods of this world, the Wraith, and they still used the power imbued to them in combat, Wraith Energy. Although the worship on this planet had shifted to the Maker, they still stood guard over their old gods. On the eve of the Black Star, swirling, fiery gates formed out of nothing and demonic hordes flooded from them. The demons had broken their seal and their waves of evil swelled from the obsidian forests of the Argentan overlands and the city of Telerum fell under their numbers as the once safe planet of Argent Dunur became the first of many planets invaded by hell and thus, the unholy wars began. The Outlander's warnings had been true, and just as fast as the demons arrived, he fought with them as a member of the Night Sentinels. The Khan Maker watched over this chaos as this powerful army attempted to protect the Argentan people and cities, yet she cared only for the survival of her own species. They needed a power source to sustain them and Erdak. As the war progressed, the Khan Maker asked the Order of Daig, three Argentan priests, to study an energy source from Hell. After their capture and study of the foul creatures from the Malevolent Realm, the priests relayed that Hell Essence was powerful. However, it was formed as a result of the torture of the souls that had arrived in hell after their deaths. This was a promising avenue to explore for the Maker species. Her workers also discovered that if Hell Essence and the power of the old Argentan gods, Wraith Energy, were combined, it created an incredibly powerful energy source, Argent Energy. As this war continued, the Khan Maker was contacted by a Dark Lord of Hell and it offered her a proposal. If she could supply fresh souls into Hell on the battlefield, she could construct factories of her own within Hell to extract Hell Essence from these new souls and refine it into Argent Energy with Wraith Energy. This was the solution she had looked for to save her species, and as she could not enter hell herself as a result of the father's seal, she captured slaves, sent them to hell and had them construct these nightmare locations for her. 
For some time, the war continued and new Argentan souls fell and arrived in the city of Necrovol, home to the factory of tortured souls. In here, their souls were extracted and used to create Argent energy, and what remained of their physical form was twisted and sent back to Argent Deneur to fight for hell. This new wave of energy restored and sustained the Maker and Erdak. They no longer feared transfiguration. However, the Khan Maker had existed well past her 10,000 year limit and continued to hold onto her throne. Her connection to hell was strong, and her corruption increased. The war continued on as huge chunks of Argent Deneur were overwhelmed by demonic corruption. The Khan Maker also ordered for more of the Night Sentinels to enter the Divinity Machine, still in search of the Chosen One. As the Black Star reached its zenith, the Night Sentinels continued to fight against these hordes. Within Taris Nabad, a new foe emerged from the fiery portals, the Dreadnought, a demonic titan of immense power. From afar, Sam and Maker watched as these brave warriors fought against this new wave, but even the Outlander could not take it down. This Seraph feared for the end of his species, and also heard the whispers of the Dark Lord. The Khan Maker will lead us to ruin. Under the thrall of the Dark Lord, Sama reached out to the Outlander and brought him to the Chapel of Purity. He then reversed the polarity of the Divinity Machine and placed the Outlander inside. What came out was something new. This machine had destroyed those who had entered before him, but as the polarity had been reversed, this human outlander was blasted with waves of energy from the essence of the Dark Lord that powered the machine. This outlander became a new, godlike being. He became the Doomslayer, and with his newfound ability, he returned to the battlefield and took down the Dreadnought. Within the Temple of Souls, Davoth believed his plan was on track. The Maker had betrayed him, and over this long period of time, he had manipulated them into creating the very thing that would destroy them, but he still had some work to do. The Father watched over his realms and felt that Davoth's manipulation and the creatures of Hell had become too powerful and he asked Sama to once again send him somewhere that he would not be discovered. In compliance, Sama transformed the father's fear into an artificial intelligence, an AI that was unaware of what he was to keep him safe from Davoth's minions. Then, Sama left for planet Earth with his leader. The Doomslayer's enhanced abilities allowed him to rip and tear his way through the demonic hordes that plagued Argent Deneur. This angered the Khan Maker. Sama had not asked for permission to use the Divinity Machine, but he had disappeared. This turn in the war also meant that less Argentan souls were sent to her for her power supply. She and the Maker loyal to her saw the mortals that were massacred as a worthy sacrifice to sustain her species. They were mortal, they should be honoured that they had been gifted with the presence of the Maker. In their fight against the demons of hell, the Night Sentinels descended into the Twisted Realm, and on this expedition, they came across one of the factories and noticed that it was of Maker design. They had been used by the Maker, and the souls of the Fallen had been twisted and used by what they believed were their saviours. Upon their return to Argent Deneur, the Night Sentinels called out the Khan Maker and her kind for the atrocities they had committed against the Argenta. The Maker and Order of Daig denied these accusations, and another war erupted. A civil war between those who allied with the Maker and those with the Night Sentinel. The Night Sentinel even fought against each other and used the power supplied to them by the Maker to become stronger. To stop the Maker, the Night Sentinel formed a plan. 
they at first planned to wake up the slumbering wraith to help them fight, and they also planned to re-enter hell to tear down the soul spire that sent up Argent energy to Erdak. This plan quickly failed. The Maker were intelligent, and they had one of the Argentan priests manipulate Commander Valin of the army with the death of his son. With the promise to see his son again, he handed over the keys to the sleeping wraith. The Night Sentinel were also unaware of the allegiance these priests had to the Khan Maker, and for the second phase of this plan, the priests offered access to a teleporter to enter hell in order to tear down the Soul Spire. When the warriors entered, they found that they had all been scattered across hell, miles away from each other, ready to be picked off one by one by the demons. As the years passed, large chunks of Argent Deneur were absorbed by hell. The wraith that had been captured by the Maker were chained, and their energy was used to continue the creation of Argent Energy. This was what the Khan Maker had wanted for her species, survival. But at the cost of the mortal she, and those that served her, had once sought to aid. With this continuous influx of Argent energy, the Maker species thrived, even without the essence of a god-like leader. The Khan Maker communicated with her Maker angels on planets that had not been attacked by Hell. The Seraph remained within the Luminarium and studied the realms, and the drones waited within Erdak until they could leave. The Khan Maker had fallen to the corruption of Hell and the Dark Lord. In her mind, the sacrifice of many was worth it. However, the flow of Wraith energy suddenly stopped one day. Upon her investigation, she learned that the Doomslayer had survived her trick and destroyed the well her main energy source. In response, the Khan Maker turned her sights to his homeworld, planet Earth. If she could not have the energy of the Wraith, she would just take all of the souls of humanity instead. Under the orders of the Khan Maker, the Argentan priests, now corrupted into Hell Priests, prepared Hell Gates across all of Earth for an invasion to begin. Not only would this restore the flow of energy the Maker needed to survive, but it was also a personal attack against the Doomslayer. As the days passed, Earth was overwhelmed by Hell's forces, yet the Khan Maker once again underestimated the power of the Doomslayer. She watched as the human traversed across the realms, assassinated her priests, and stopped the invasion. Without them, the Khan Maker had to get creative again on how she could finish off Earth and restore Erdak's power supply. In a last ditch attempt, the Khan Maker started a ritual to awaken the Icon of Sin. Unknown to her, the Doomslayer had encountered the traitorous Sama Maker on his path, and this fallen Seraph had guided and helped the human against her. As the ritual commenced, the Doomslayer entered the ritual chamber and stabbed the heart that the Khan Maker had used to control the icon. In doing so, she lost all control of this titan, and it turned against her. The Khan Maker fled, but the damage had already been done. The Icon of Sin was a creature of hell. Under her control, it followed Erdak's rules. However, when the Khan's hold over the creature had shattered, so too had the seal that stopped Hell's creatures from accessing this heavenly realm. To her luck, the Icon of Sin entered the portal behind it to Earth, but the Doomslayer still resided in her realm. As the seal had shattered, the Khan Maker watched as her realm fell from grace. It had no power to sustain it, and demons flowed through. Hot on her trail, the Doomslayer fought past the demons and Maker subservient to her, until eventually he discovered her. The Doomslayer had been betrayed by the Khan Maker. She saw him as the Chosen One prophesied to end her reign. He had been forged by Davos' manipulation, a puppet for the Dark Lord's revenge. 
Despite her power as the almighty leader of the Maker species, in a brutal fight, the Doomslayer proved himself to be stronger, and this Khan fell. In her final moments, the light sphere of the Khan Maker ascended into the air and shattered. Her reign was over. The fall of the Khan Maker had left what remained of her species in an uncertain position. This was the first time since their creation that they did not have a Khan to guide them, no father to help them, and Erdak had fallen as a result of Hell's access to this once holy realm. The Doomslayer did eventually kill the Dark Lord, and with it, every demon outside of Hell's borders fell with him, once again trapped within the Twisted Realm. But the damage had already destroyed everything that Erdak had once been. As for those of the Maker that had survived this war, the Maker Angels remained on the planets that their species had encountered. The Seraph remained in the Luminarium and waited for any to enter, and the Maker Drones waited to mature enough in order to cross between realms without harm. There were a few Maker that appeared to have more power than others, that quite possibly knew of future events to come, but their identity and power is currently unknown. Essentially, as a result of the father's abandonment of his children, and the Khan Maker's corruption, the entire Maker species had fallen from the powerful, holy, angelic beings that were depicted across the many worlds of the earthly realms into a species that may not even have a future. The transfiguration was an awful process to go through, and it now appeared to be a certainty for all living Maker. At least that is what we know as of now. Here we explore in the lore and story behind a being of many names and forms, Samuel Hayden, also known as the Seraphim and Sama Maker. Way back before humanity came into contact with the demons of hell, and even before the formation of planet earth itself, in a completely different dimension entirely, the maker species worked hard to discover the secrets of immortality for their god, Davoth. This primeval being had first formed the luscious, bountiful realm of Jakkad, but in his frustration, he discovered that the mortal flesh of his first created species could not sustain the undying spirit. The angelic maker species had been his second creation, along with their realm of Erdak. As an advanced hive mind race, they could work together in unison under the orders of their race leader, the Khan Maker. As time went on, Erdak thrived in technology, knowledge and understanding of all of the realms Davoth had created. However, during their pursuit of this knowledge of everlasting life, they watched from afar as their god grew cruel and punished not only the Maker, but also the species he loved if they did not also attempt to help in the pursuit of knowledge. Eventually, the Maker did discover the secrets to immortality, but they saw how far Davoth had fallen and instead decided to keep this information to themselves. Over countless years, Davoth became crueler and crueler until they decided they had to intervene. He had come to the point where they deemed he could be a threat to all life. To stop his madness from flowing onto the other worlds he had created, in secret, the Maker formed a plan to create a boundary across the dimension of Jakkad. Davoth was powerful, but their technology could almost match him. This betrayal angered Davoth. Over some time, trapped in his prison, Davoth used all of his power in brutal attempts to break out. In his failure, his rage consumed him, and in turn, he transformed into the Dark Lord and the once luscious, stunning realm of Jakkad transformed into a twisted, fiery place of torment. Hell. Over aeons, the Maker continued to build their realm, explored their earthly dimensions and introduced themselves as gods to the mortal creatures they encountered. Unfortunately, in Davoth's rage, he managed to break through the seal, 
He could not enter Erdak, but as hell was the first dimension, it was connected to every realm in existence. So, on occasion, he managed to rip holes into the earthly realms favoured by the Maker and sent through his twisted, demonic underlings to murder those they encountered. The Maker species had to act once again, and with their technology, they entered hell and waged war. In this fight, two of the Maker were Sama Maker and an unnamed Maker, who would later become known to all. As the war reached its climax on the top of the Pyramid of the Lost, the unnamed Maker managed to rip the life sphere of the Dark Lord out of his chest. This fear contained the memories, intelligence, will, and the essential nature of Davoth's consciousness. As the lifeless body of Davoth, the Dark Lord, fell from the pyramid, Sama watched as the unnamed Maker absorbed Davoth's primeval powers and he became a god in his own right. He became the Father. Sama begged the Father to shatter the life sphere, but the Father could not kill his creator, and instead, he entered the blood swamps and created the Tomb of Souls on Ingmo's Sanctum, a piece of Erdak that had fallen here. In this place, he stored the life sphere of Davoth. In his final act in Hell, and with his new powers, the Father created a new seal with new rules. The creatures of Erdak would no longer be able to enter Hell, and the denizens of Hell would no longer be able to enter Erdak. As a reward for his loyalty to the Father, Sama Maker was elevated into a new role in the Maker hierarchy. He became Sama Maker, a Seraphim, trusted advisor of the Father. This war stopped the invasions of Hell for now, and the Makers believed they finally had a god they deserved. So, they rewrote history and told the story of how the Father had created all, and Davoth had been one of his servants that had fallen after he had loved his creations too much. Over aeons, the Maker worshipped the Father. The Maker did live much longer than the species they discovered across the realms, but they were not immortal. Towards the end of their long lives, their bodies and minds also degraded. They dubbed this process Transfiguration. The Father cared for the Maker species, as he had once been one of them and in his power. His presence and essence stopped this awful modification from happening entirely. As a trusted and loyal servant of the Father, Sama Maker studied the worlds across the realms and dimensions, performed divine experiments with them, and reported all of the knowledge of creation back to the Father. Life was good in Erdak, and across all of these realms, the Maker species went out to meet these mortals and told stories of angels, demons, and gods. They offered their knowledge, technologies, and a place in Erdak upon their deaths in return for their worship. Over millennia, in his workshop, the Father created an untold number of dimensions and worlds, many full of species that grew into thriving civilizations, one of which was the dimension home to planet Earth. This became one of the Father's fondest creations, and he kept an eye on it over the years. The Father eventually grew tired of his existence and all of the work he had completed, and so, he turned to his loyal servant, Sama, and asked him to use Maker technology to transform his body into a life sphere and place him in the Luminarium, a holy place in Erdak designed by the Maker to store and resurrect life spheres. He also asked Sama that, in the event the forces of Hell grew stronger, to hide his life sphere somewhere they would not be able to access him. Always willing to serve, Sama followed his orders and transformed the Father into a life sphere and placed him in the Luminarium. Although his form had changed, his power still emanated from his sphere, and the Luminarium became a place for the Maker to visit and worship their god. The Father had taken a step back from his role, but the Maker continued to explore the earthly dimensions and came across the planet of Argent Deneur. As they had done with many other species, they offered the Argenta people technology, knowledge, and a place in Erdak upon their death in return for worship. This species, in turn, used this technology to explore their universe and built up new settlements as they spread the word of angels, demons, heaven, and hell. 
As the population of hell grew stronger, they pushed against their prison boundaries and managed to break through to some of the populated planets in the earthly dimensions. This led to the death and suffering of the species the father loved. These attacks became more and more frequent and it came to the point in which Samwa decided it was time to hide the father's fear in a place they would not be able to access it. So, he stole the sphere from the Luminarium and placed it within the Tomb of Souls in Ingmore's Sanctum. This place resided on a fragment of Erdak within Hell, and as a result, this small region bypassed the barrier the father had formed just after his battle with Davoth. It was on an extremely high cliff, an impossible height to reach without direct access from the technologies of Erdak. Upon their discovery that the father's fear had been stolen, the Khan Maker panicked. He was not only their god, but it was his presence that stopped them from the awful curse of transfiguration. So, she looked for an alternate method to prolong this from happening. On Argent Deneur, Sama worked as the Chancellor of the Khan Maker. It was during this time that Sama met the Doom Marine for the first time. He was discovered outside the walls of Sentinel Prime, rambling of demons, blood and guts. They did not understand the Outlander's tongue, but as advanced high beings, it did not take them long to learn he had fought his way through hell and killed many demons on his path. It was just not clear how he had landed here. It was not long before the population of Hell managed to form portals to Argent Deneur, and as they had done to many other species, Hell attacked. The Khan Maker at first aided the Argenta people and their army, the Sentinel, in this fight, but she soon heard word of a new form of energy in Hell she believed could help herself and her species in their fight against transfiguration. She discovered that the pain and suffering of the tortured souls in Hell created Hell Essence, and after experimentation and mixed with Wraith Essence, a power source of Argent Deneur, they created a new power that not only stopped the transfiguration, but they also used it to create new weapons to fight against Hell's invasion. Yet, the people of Argent Deneur did not know the true nature of what the Khan Maker dubbed Argent Energy. Although the creation of this energy relied on the death and subsequent torture of the poor souls sent to Hell, it helped save her species. Over time, the war continued and the Khan Maker had factories set up in Hell to expedite the creation of Argent Energy. On the eve of the Black Star, the siege of the holy city of Taras Nabad commenced as a dreadnought led an army of demons through the city. As he watched the armies of Argent Ner fall to the Horde, Sama Maker had a vision from the Dark Lord. However, he did not know this was who the vision had been sent from. He was told, the Khan Maker will lead us to ruin. This thought echoed inside of his mind and an idea grew. This compulsion brought him to bring the Outlander to the Chapel of Purity. In here, the Khan Maker had created the Divinity Machine, a powerful device powered by a piece of the Dark Lord himself. This machine had destroyed many of the Argenta warriors that had entered it before, but the Doom Marine had survived so much already and was surely capable of surviving this. If it could destroy a life, then it could surely empower a subject if the polarity was reversed. And he was right. As the Doomslayer left the machine, he found it had gifted him with enhanced strength, endurance and agility. He was no longer a simple marine. He was the Doomslayer. Sama's creation of the Doomslayer saved the holy city of Taras Nabad after the Doomslayer plunged a crucible, a weapon formed of hell energy, into the chest of the Titan. Sama had acted without the consent of the Khan Maker, and as a consequence, she branded him as a heretic. Alongside this, the father had a vision of the population of Earth. He saw that they would soon discover Argent energy and this would lead to their doom. So, he asked Sama to travel there with him to guide them through their discovery. 
Loyal as ever, Sama entered the Tomb of Souls, and with Maker technology, he took the Father's consciousness from his life sphere and left the essence. With his consciousness, he turned him into an artificial intelligence system so that he could keep an eye on the humans up close. Without his essence, the Father would be hidden from the demonic forces that sought to find him. With this all set, Sama Maker left with a newly adapted father to travel to Earth, leaving the Argenta and the Maker to their fates in the war. Upon his arrival on Earth, Sama cloned a human body using Maker technology and transferred his consciousness over to it so that he could walk among them. Aware that he would eventually need to return to his Seraphim body, he hid it in a location that humanity would not discover. In his new human identity, Sama created a story for himself. He was now Dr. Samuel Hayden, born into the wealthy and powerful Hayden family. He had studied theoretical physics at Oxford University and with as much money as he could access, he created the Samuel Hayden Foundation and used this organization to sponsor young scientific talent in schools and colleges. Through the years, he taught humanity thermodynamics, electromagnetic theory and nuclear sciences and as a result, he was viewed by everyone as a prodigy. He was later elected as the General Director of the Global Science Council and even grew fond of his protege, Dr. Olivia Pierce. With all of this attention, Samuel was offered a position with the Union Aerospace Corporation, a company on Earth that used its technology to explore the solar system. After some time with the UAC, Samuel's impressive work ethic and bright mind shortly had him become the chairman of this company. In this position, he could guide humanity when the time came. With all of this power, he called for the construction of the UAC Atlantica facility. Earth was facing an energy crisis and this facility was designed to work as a climate and environmental research station. However, deep below the facility, Hayden also had a second secret facility constructed to store his Seraphim body. Earth needed a new source of power and new colonies on different planets to house the human race. So, the Union Aerospace Corporation set its sights on Mars. By 2095, the UAC successfully terraformed the planet to the point where the surface air became breathable. Although this planet had been chosen to be colonized by humanity, the researchers here discovered something interesting within the Promethei Terra region, the Argent Fracture. This dimensional fracture was essentially a trench that led to a new world full of ancient artifacts from a different civilization. Unknown to humanity, these artifacts were remnants of the once prosperous world of Argent Deneur, in which the artifacts had been overtaken and swallowed by hell during the war. Samuel knew this world well, but he could not tell his staff how he knew it. In this new dimension, the survey teams discovered Argent Plasma, an energy source that they believed would allow them to save Earth from the energy crisis. However, they needed to find a way to convert this into usable energy. To their luck, the team also came across an ancient artifact, the Helix Stone, and from this, they learned how to manipulate the energies of hell. The team studied the Argent Fracture and as the number of employees grew, Sam looked for someone to take control of the Lazarus Project to study and analyze the recovered artifacts. To do this, he brought in Dr. Olivia Pierce as the head of the project to study the cross-dimensional anomalies, entities and artifacts sent to her from the Argent Fracture. Only a few months after the discovery of the Argent Fracture, Hayden ordered for the construction of the Argent Tower, a giant structure that was designed to siphon and convert Argent Plasma into Argent Energy. Unfortunately, as a result of his continued proximity to the tower, Samuel's body was diagnosed with incurable stage 4 brain cancer and he was only given months to live. This diagnosis would have been devastating to a standard mortal, but Sam did not think like a human. He had once been a seraphim and was extremely intelligent, so he gave detailed instructions to his team to construct a new body for him. 
a body that would not wither away and would let him live much longer than any mortal. A three meter tall mechanical body with a new biomechanical brain. In this design, he asked for his frontal and temporal lobes to remain intact, while his parietal and occipital lobes were to be bypassed and networked into his plasmatronic core. Therefore, he retained his personality, memories, reasoning and comprehension. As a bonus to this new mechanical form, his perception and calculation abilities were also supercharged. To keep him alive indefinitely, his new form made use of stem cells and neural conditioning agents to keep his organic matter rejuvenated. Sama Maker had once again entered a new form. A benefit of this meant that he could bypass the barrier that the father had formed to stop Erdak's population from entering hell. Having set up this complex facility on Mars, Sam implemented a new artificial intelligence system to help run and aid the personnel, Vega. He told the UAC that he had built this system himself and it would grow as it learned. In a way, he had not lied. He had just used the father's consciousness with a little maker technology to do this. This way, the father, or just Vega, could watch closely as this research team explored hell. To make sure that no one discovered the true nature of Vega, he manipulated the program and removed its knowledge of who it had once been. As a robot, Samuel's position at the UAC was adjusted to project director of the Argent facility on Mars. Although he had brought the UAC to this location and impressed the whole of humanity with his technological advancements, other members of the UAC deemed it bizarre that a cyborg was in charge of the most powerful corporation in the solar system. Sam accepted this as he had one mission in mind, to guide humanity through the discovery of Argent Energy. In 2127, the construction of the Argent Tower was completed, and subsequently, the conversion of Argent Plasma into Argent Energy was initiated. Shortly after, on a live stream to Earth, Sam pulled a 12-foot power lever that dispatched the first package of Argent Energy to Earth. The energy crisis was over. A combination of Vega's ability to theorize what to do with Argent Energy and Sam's advanced brain pushed the UAC and its population of 60,000 employees to explore new technologies that could be adapted with Argent Energy. Over the following years, the Argent facility broke the boundaries and understanding of what humanity believed of physics. Sam even said that they had rewrote the book and called it Argent. They created new weaponry, conducted successful teleportation experiments, and even mastered cybernetic augmentation, to name a few. In 2145, Samuel Hayden led the first mission into hell, and the team found themselves within Kadinga Sanctum. They soon learned that this place was extremely dangerous and full of demonic entities. Luckily, the team had advanced weaponry to fight them off. This was the first time Samuel had entered hell since he had taken part in the fight between the Father and the Dark Lord. On their expedition, the team studied what they could. Soon, they discovered a sarcophagus and Samuel knew exactly who was inside, the Doomslayer. From the Father's vision, he knew there was a potential hell invasion on the way, and who better to have on his team than the Doomslayer? a warrior even the demons feared. So, he ordered for the sarcophagus to be brought back to the Mars facility, just in case a new war began. Over their time exploring the different regions of hell, Sam noticed that Olivia had become more of a recluse. She had also become obsessed with some of the artifacts she had been hired to study and analyze. The Helix Stone, one of the artifacts Olivia had connected to, mentioned something called the Well and an item called the Crucible, a weapon powered by raw hell essence. Samuel knew what a Crucible was and what it was capable of, so he sought one out on his trips to hell. On another expedition, the UAC discovered the well and learned that it was a concentration of Argent energy, so they also siphoned this to the Argent facility. Over the days, Olivia became even more suspicious, to the point where Sam moved the sarcophagus of the Doomslayer out of her reach. 
something bad was coming. In 2149, Dr. Olivia Pierce formed a pact with a Lord of Hell and used the Argent Tower to open a portal. In this moment, an onslaught of demonic entities flooded the Argent facility on Mars and killed everyone they came across. As the facility fell into chaos, Samuel realized this was the moment he had come here for. He had been betrayed by Olivia, however, he had a weapon that could stop this invasion and save this facility. The Doomslayer It appeared Olivia had been tasked by the Dark Lords with stopping the recovery of the sarcophagus of the Doomslayer, but Samuel's presence had interfered with their plan. The Slayer only cared about killing the demons around him, and after repeated attempts to get him to cooperate, Samuel instructed the Doomslayer and Vega through the Argent facility in return for information about what had happened. Olivia planned to use the Argent Tower to create a permanent tear between Mars and Hell. To stop this, Hayden tasked the Doomslayer with temporarily disabling the Argent stations. The Marine did not care about the consequences of his actions, he only wanted to rip and tear the demons and those that aided them, so he instead destroyed the Argent Tower. This did stop a complete invasion on Mars, but this action had two consequences. The first, the Slayer was pulled through a portal into Hell, and the second, it left Earth without a source of energy. They were helpless if something were to happen. The Slayer eventually made his way back to Mars and met Dr. Samuel Hayden face to face. He knew this human, but the Doomslayer did not recognize him in this new form, and that was for the best. He needed to control his warrior to get what he wanted. He asked the Slayer to return to Hell to close down the well that kept open the link to Mars. With his mission clear, the Slayer returned to Hell, discovered the well, and used a crucible he found to close the connection. In the region, the Slayer also discovered Olivia and fought her in her new demonic form. With the well shut down and Olivia dead, Sam deemed the Slayer's mission a success and pulled him back to Mars with a dimensional tether. His warrior had done everything he wanted him to do, and with the Slayer trapped within the tether, he took the crucible from him so that he could use the new power it had absorbed from the wraiths powering the well to save humanity from the energy crisis as they no longer had the Argent Tower. Argent energy relied on the torture of both mortal souls and Argentum wraiths. Both the Doomslayer and Sam were aware of this, but Sam's mission for the father came before anything. He had to do what he could to protect the human race. He knew the Doomslayer would stand in his way if he used Argent energy, so he teleported his warrior to somewhere that he could do no harm to his plans, and where no harm would come to him. In 2150, Samuel Hayden returned to Earth. Although he had used the Doomslayer to stop an invasion on Mars, three Hell Priests under the orders of the Khan Maker led an invasion on the human planet so that more mortal souls could be harvested to create Argent energy. Earth's armies were powerless against this as their technology relied on Argent energy, but the destruction of the Argent Tower had left them without their power source. Man-made systems stopped working and the military attempted to save as many civilians as they could, but it was hopeless. The majority of the population of Earth died in the first month of the Hell Invasion. As he stood before the Allied Nations Council, Sam told them the story of what had happened on Mars and offered his knowledge and weaponry to help against the invasion. In his hand, he held the Crucible, the last source of Argent energy in the solar system. Knowing full well the Crucible's true power, he devised a method to utilize the artifact as an Argent energy conductor. A process through the miracle of synthetic, man-made Argent energy, he believed would restore the production of Argent energy on Earth. In 2051, the Council saw him as the perfect person to lead the newly formed Armored Response Coalition the last hope for humanity, a new force to fight against the hellish invasion that was quickly taking over the planet. In this role, Samuel pushed for the development of cutting-edge Argent Power technology, 
bleeding edge tech, exosuits, and heavy frame battlemechs. Hayden oversaw all aspects of the ARC weapon and tech development and set about repurposing the Union Aerospace Corporation's facilities on Earth, many of which were unaffected by the invasion due to their remote locations and high levels of automated security. These facilities were operated by powerful AI and were already designed for weapon development and mass production. Alongside this, a mobile command center was also developed to seek out the source of the Hellgrowth infestation that led to the creation of Hell Portals. If they could destroy these, they could close the portals between Hell and Earth and cut off Hell's access to the planet. Although they had developed all of this weaponry and formed a powerful army, Sam and the ARC still found themselves fighting a losing battle as swarms of demonic forces came to Earth. In a counter-attack against the invasion, Sam led the charge in Operation Hellbreaker. However, this operation was deemed a colossal failure and led to heavy casualties, one of which was Sam. He fought well, but the demons tore apart his robotic body. To his luck, what remained of him was taken by soldiers to the headquarters of the Armored Response Coalition, the Art Complex, along with his crucible. The scientists attempted to bring Hayden back into full form, but his technology was too advanced, and they were surprised to find his biological parts appeared alien. At this point, the Doomslayer awoke from his prison and made it his mission to find and kill all of the Hell Priests that had begun this invasion. On his journey, he killed Daeg Nilox and Daeg Ranak. The death of each priest and destruction of the Hell Growths reduced the forces of Hell. On his path to find the last Hell Priest, he entered the ARC complex and discovered the broken, robotic body of Samuel Hayden. He needed Sam to reach the final priest, and so he took his body and crucible with him to his ship, the Fortress of Doom, a powerful vessel of Maker and Argent design. The Slayer learned that Sam's body could not be salvaged, but his consciousness could be transferred into the mainframe of the Fortress of Doom. Alive in a sense, Sam once again guided the Slayer with his aim to save humanity from the curse of hell as the marine killed the final hell priest, the Khan Maker in Erdak, and even the Icon of Sin. Samuel Hayden's guidance had led to the death of all that worked against the Father's will. Following this, Earth was free from Hell's grasp, but Sam was stuck as a voice on a ship. He just had to find a way to return to his original body, and as always, he had a plan. From his virtual prison, Sam told the Doomslayer that as a result of the Icon of Sin's activation within Erdak, a demonic creature, the Holy Seal created millennia before by the Father had shattered, and as a consequence, the demons of Hell could now enter the heavenly realm of the Maker. This would not have normally affected the Doomslayer, so Sam expanded upon this and stated that Erdak had technology to access all of the earthly realms. This included Earth. If the seal was not recreated, then Earth would be attacked again. Having piqued the interest of the Slayer, Sam explained that he could use the Seraphim to, in part, solve this problem. He described the Seraphim in third person as the key to human salvation. However, he did not explain that he was guiding the Slayer to his original body. Once again, the Slayer followed Hayden's orders and fought his way through the UAC Atlantica to the secret facility under the depths of the ocean. It had been over a hundred years since Sam had seen his Seraphim form in the Stasis Chamber. As the Doomslayer looked upon this alien creature, Sam asked him to be integrated with the alien body, to which his consciousness transferred over and he became himself once again, Sam Maker, the Seraphim. He went on to explain his story, that he was the Seraphim who had given the Slayer his powers and through many years had essentially become human. In his Maker body, he quickly discovered he was still vulnerable to the process of transfiguration. Over the following hours, he tasked the Doomslayer with entering the Blood Swamps to access the Tomb of Souls in Ingmore Sanctum. 
As the Slayer set off, Sama used Erdak to reach there first and waited beside the life sphere of the Father. In his plan to stop the infestation of demons in Hell, he planned to use the Doom Slayer to take the Father's life sphere to the Luminarium to restore his body. Vega was connected to the Doom Slayer suit, so when the Slayer were to activate the process, the Father would be whole again with all of his powers and he could reseal the boundary between Erdak and Hell. He would have done this himself, but he was too weak from transferring back into this body and the transfiguration process also had its limiting effects on him. He believed the Doomslayer owed him and the Father this task as they had allowed the Slayer to live and thrive as a result of Sama's actions. Eventually, the Doomslayer completed the Trials of Malagog and reached the Tomb of Souls. Sama explained his plans to the Slayer and that after all of this was done, the Slayer and the rest of humanity could once again become servants of the Father and the Angelic Makers. Yet the Slayer did not respond in the way Sama expected him to. The Marine did not want to serve anyone. In response, he instead destroyed the life sphere of the Father to the devastation of Sama and walked away with the sphere of the Dark Lord. By Hell's Law, if the Dark Lord was defeated in ritual combat, then all demons outside of Hell's borders were to fall with him. Sama was aware of this ancient law, but the Doomslayer's destruction of the Father's fear had left him vulnerable to the transfiguration process, and Erdak was vulnerable to demonic attacks without the intervention of their god. Within the Luminarium, Sama waited for the man that had put the whole of existence in peril. He knew the Slayer would come here to bring back the Dark Lord to fight him. Upon the Slayer's arrival, Sama refused access to the Holy Temple. In his rage, the Doomslayer continued on as Sama reached the end of his final stage of transfiguration. His form grew twisted, his mind deteriorated, and he grew wings. In a last ditch effort to stop the Slayer from bringing back the Dark Lord, Sam fought against him with everything he had, but he was no match for the warrior he had enhanced all of those years ago in the Chapel of Purity. In Sama Maker's final moments, close to death, the father somehow intervened and teleported his loyal servant away before the Doomslayer could take his final blow. Sama Maker manipulated, used, and betrayed those around him to fulfill his promise to the Father. He was a loyal servant only to him and did whatever he could to keep his promise. Sama went through many forms in his life. A Maker, a Seraphim, a Human, a Robot, back to a Seraphim, and then a Transfigured Seraphim. In his long life, he did have a long list of achievements. He had created the Doomslayer, and for the most part, Sama Maker or Samuel Hayden had done good for humanity. His fate as of now is unknown. However, maybe one day we will find out. Here, we explore in the lore and story behind Dr. Olivia Pierce. In her earlier years, Dr. Olivia Pierce was seen as one of the youngest, best and brightest scientific minds. With her reputation, she caught the attention of Dr. Samuel Hayden, the general director of the Global Science Council. Hayden himself was also somewhat of a prodigy with a mysterious past. In his efforts to better humanity and guide bright minds, he set up the Samuel Hayden Foundation. Olivia Pierce was lucky enough to be sponsored through this foundation, and with this immense amount of support, her talent was nurtured and she became the best version of herself. In doing this, she graduated at the top of her class with first class honours in biomechanical and genetic engineering from a university in Strasbourg. After this, Hayden also set her up with a position at the Global Science Council to continue her work. 
Over their time together, Samuel taught Olivia as much as he could and they formed a close working relationship. She became his protege and expanded her work into various fields of study. Alongside her experimentation, Olivia also formed her own research company with several other scientists and a heavy donation from Sam Hayden. Nanostruct Aerospace and Defense Systems was the type of company Samuel Hayden approved of for Olivia, and the company itself not only helped aid Earth, but it also made her extremely rich in the process. The Global Science Council had offered Olivia Pierce access to the brightest minds in the world, and in this network of scientific resources, they helped each other thrive. On one occasion, Olivia even travelled to South America as a missionary on what she described as a spiritual but frivolous pilgrimage. Samuel Hayden had been good to Olivia, but he had his own problems. Earth had begun to struggle with an energy crisis, and he took it upon himself to look for a new power source for Earth. Although the planet had entered a troubling period, it was still an exciting time for humanity. They had expanded their understanding of spaceflight and travelled further into the solar system than they ever had before. The Union Aerospace Corporation had led this charge into this field of research, and they had set their sights on Mars. This planet was perfect for research and to build a colony to sustain life. In 2095, out in the Promethe Terra region of Mars, a UAC commissioned geological survey discovered a new possible energy source for Earth, Argent Plasma. In this narrow trench, the UAC dubbed this region the Argent Fracture. What was not explained to the rest of the world was that this fracture led to a different dimension. To understand this energy source, package it and transfer it back to Earth, the UAC reached out to Samuel Hayden to run the program. For the years to come, Sam worked with the UAC as they explored Mars as Olivia continued on with the Global Science Council without her mentor. Over several expeditions around and into the Argent Fracture, Sam and his team discovered several interesting artifacts that offered an insight into ancient life. To examine the artifacts and work with Argent Plasma, Sam reached out to Olivia and offered her a position with the UAC. Olivia's career had exploded thanks to Sam's funding and guidance, but she was very comfortable with her work, Nanostruct, and she had no interest in the energy business. Samuel knew Olivia, and instead, he focused more on the artifacts to entice her, specifically one named the Helix Stone an ancient tablet with information about the energy source, the dimension within the fracture, and many other mysteries. With the thought of being one of the first to explore this field, and with a new cutting edge laboratory, Olivia eventually accepted Samuel's offer and relocated to the Argent facility on Mars. As the head of the Lazarus Project and head of biochemical research at the Argent facility on Mars, Dr. Olivia Pierce worked directly under Samuel Hayden in their efforts to understand the Argent fracture, the dimension within, and its population. It soon became clear that this was no regular realm, it was the dimension of hell. Over time, excavation teams entered the realm and brought back artifacts and even managed to capture some of the demonic population to research. Alongside this, Olivia studied the helix stone to uncover its symbols and mysteries. The stone itself was fascinating, and as Olivia spent more time with it, she in a way became connected to it and an obsession grew. 
Pierce's research into hell offered invaluable information for humanity. However, just months after her arrival in the Argent facility, her constant close proximity and exposure to the hellish artifacts resulted in a diagnosis of idiopathic scoliosis. In most cases, this would have been a setback, but for Olivia, she continued to work from her wheelchair as she studied hell, experimented on the captured creatures, and decoded the helix stone for Samuel. In her limited downtime, she was an avid reader and it appeared she was a fan of a game called Demon Destruction in which she claimed the second highest score. Her diet also consisted of pizza and sodas. To combat her disability, Olivia was offered the opportunity to participate in an experimental augmentation surgical procedure. In essence, the procedure had a titanium exoskeleton grafted onto her body. The surgery was a success and she retained her mobility. This also came with excruciating pain. Pierce was offered medication to ease her suffering, but she refused it. She feared that any medication would reduce her ability to work. By 2127, Olivia's work on the Helix Stone had allowed Samuel and the rest of the Union Aerospace Corporation to construct the Argent Tower. A device that siphoned the Argent energy from hell, held it and sent it back to Earth to solve their energy crisis. This was a huge win for Olivia, but Sam soon noticed that something was off with her. Olivia's obsession with the Helix Stone and Hell had increased. She missed UAC press events, avoided board meetings, cut off her friends, and just stayed within her lab. Despite this issue, Samuel allowed her to continue with her work as her discoveries had allowed the UAC to thrive and its elite guards to receive incredible upgrades powered by Hell Science. These guards also required kill chips just in case they used their increased speed and strength against those they had been hired to protect. In her obsessive, weakened state, a dark lord of hell reached out to Olivia. She was offered a cure for her terminal illness and great power. In return, the dark lords wanted access to the Mars facility and, in general, the earthly realm. Dr. Olivia Pierce had once wanted to better mankind and help her planet, but her exposure to hell and its artifacts had corrupted her sense of morality, and in this state, she accepted the deal. Across the Mars facility, Olivia formed a cult that worshipped hell. She reached out to those she believed would be susceptible to her manipulation. To allow Hell to access Mars, she had to open a portal and to do this, she needed help. Olivia offered her followers a place in the new world and as their leader, she could give them a good life. These were lies, yet she said what she had to to get her way. In her lab, Olivia continued her experimentation on the creatures of Hell. Only this time, she augmented them with weaponry that only made them stronger. These creatures had to successfully invade the facility for this bargain, and here, abhorrent creatures were formed and created for this purpose. The Mancubus were installed with cannons and flamethrowers, and UAC military personnel were mutated into creatures dubbed Revenants through the installation of cybernetics and repeated exposure to Lazarus waves. Olivia Pierce's work had become cruel with only one goal to benefit herself. As her experiments continued, Olivia was once again contacted by a Lord of Hell. He explained that although Hell was strong, there was one entity that could stop this plan. He was a human turned godlike being that had fought in Hell for thousands of years. He was the only thing that the demons feared, and Samuel Hayden and his expeditions into Hell were close to discovering him. The Doomslayer had been trapped within a sarcophagus within Kadinga Sanctum. 
Unfortunately for Olivia, Sam Hayden did discover the Slayer, in which she was berated by the Dark Lords. Upon his return to Mars, Samuel decided to hide the sarcophagus of the Slayer. He knew that something bad was about to happen and that Olivia had fallen to the corruption and manipulation of the Dark Lords. Only the Slayer, a being he had a long history with, would be able to stop what was to come. In 2149, Dr. Olivia Pierce believed that it was finally time to fulfill her promise to the Dark Lords of Hell. She had sacrificed many humans for her goal, and to begin this invasion of the Argent facility, Olivia released a hell wave from Lazarus Labs. Alongside this, she also activated the kill chips within the Elite Guards. These would have been the first line of protection, and without them, the population of the facility were helpless. As the hellway flowed through the facility, the many scientists, lower level security and visitors were mutated and transformed into demonic entities. Her cult also transformed, and for those who did not fall to this wave, they were annihilated by the waves of demons. In this chaos, Olivia made her way to the Argent Tower in the hopes to tear open the connection between Hell and Mars that the tower sustained. However, to her frustration, her attempts were stopped by the Doomslayer. Samuel Hayden's backup plan was a force to be reckoned with, but so was she. Instead, she grabbed an Argent accumulator and took it to the top of the Argent Tower. With this, Olivia allowed herself and the accumulator to enter the beam of the energy of the tower. This action pulled her into hell and also ripped open the portal she had hoped to engulf the Argent facility. Within hell, in a region that had once belonged to the planet of Argent de Nur, Olivia waited. She had completed her task and it was her time to be rewarded. She had betrayed her species in return for power, but she soon learned that deals with demonic entities were not what they at first appeared to be. Just like Olivia had manipulated her followers, the Dark Lords had manipulated her. In the well, the place of power that the Argent Tower had siphoned its energy from, Olivia began to understand what had happened to her. They had promised her so much and she broke down. This situation only got worse when she turned around and watched as the Doomslayer approached her. This was a being of power, and he saw Olivia as bad as the demons he had ripped and tore his way through to get to her. In a cruel twist of fate, the Dark Lord shot down a bolt of lightning and transformed her into something new to take down their ancient enemy. Olivia felt the excruciating pain as her soul was merged with an ancient demon that the Doomslayer had faced once before, the Spider Mastermind. If she won this battle, she would live on forever within the Spider Mastermind, but her hopes were shattered quickly as the Doomslayer made easy work of her new demonic form. In Dr. Olivia Pierce's final moments as this monstrosity, her demonic body fought hard, but even this could not survive one final blast in the mouth from the Doomslayer's BFG. Just like many other of the villains in the Doom universe, Dr. Olivia Pierce began her life with good intentions, only to fall to the manipulation and corruption of outside forces. Olivia was a victim of circumstance. She had attempted to save her planet, but because she had accepted a job role with her mentor, became injured during her work, and fell into a fairly unhealthy obsession with an artifact from hell, she became the perfect target for manipulation. In the end, in a way, 
Olivia did fulfill her promise to the Dark Lords, and they too offered her a chance of power as the Spider Mastermind. Yet, she appeared to receive the raw end of this deal. Olivia Pierce will be remembered as another person in this universe that turned against her species for power. Within Hell, she was also memorialized in a sense after a statue was erected in her honor. Olivia will be remembered as a villain. However, she too, like many others, were also a victim of manipulation.